The Budokai series was a huge part of my childhood, with Budokai 1 being the first ever Dragon Ball Z game I got to play. This is a compilation of my analysis and retrospectives of every Dragon Ball Z Budokai game. The video is ordered by the game's release date. Each game is its own chapter, which can be found in the description. This project has taken me almost two years to complete, and I hope that you enjoy. It has been almost 20 years since Budokai 1 was released. If you're like me, growing up as a Dragon Ball Z fan in the late 90s and early 2000s, Budokai 1 was probably one of your first exposures to a DBZ game. And what an introduction it was. As a kid, I loved this game. It had it all. Stunning 3D visuals, a cinematic story mode, mini games, Piccolo loved it. But it's been a long time since I've played it, and it's not a game I've returned to as frequently as I did with Budokai 2 or 3. So after all these years, does Budokai 1 still hold up? Well, let's find out together. Dragon Ball Z Budokai was released in 2002 for the PlayStation 2. The following year, the GameCube version was released with the original Xbox going without. <laughs> Tragedy, ain't it? As the GameCube version was released almost a year after the PlayStation 2 version, the opportunity was taken to improve the graphics using cell shading. But for this retrospective, I'm going to be playing through the version that I played as a kid. And that is the PAL version on the PS2, which has a few differences to the North American release. One of the biggest differences you'll notice is the lack of English voice acting. Yeah, I don't know why the English voice tracks are missing. They are in the North American version. Maybe they just ran out of time? Hey, we finally have the dub ready. Ah, oh, it's fine then. We already released the game. Whatever the reason, the PAL version just has subtitles, which can be extremely entertaining in their own right. Trunks. Oh, you and Sally's! What does that mean? I have no fucking clue. Like, I, I'm just so confused. Booting up the game, we come to another difference between the versions, and that is the opening cinematic. For North America, they got a recreation of the anime opening with the Rock the Dragon music in the background. For PAL regions, we got an opening that just uses clips from the cutscenes in the game. While the PAL version is very nostalgic for me, I much prefer the other version. It has more dynamic animations and is just a lot more reminiscent of the anime. It does have its quirks though, mostly the awkward timing of the scenes. It lingers on some scenes for too long and it just brings down the pacing. I did not edit this. It goes on for this long. The PAL opening is kind of low effort in comparison with the reusing of the animations from the story mode. The way Budokai 1 presents its story is through recreations of scenes seen in the anime and manga. If you play Budokai 1 and 2, you'll notice how much of a downgrade those two games got in their delivery of their stories. The character animations are honestly some of the best seen in any Dragon Ball Z game. Just comparing it with the cutscenes from Tenkaichi 1, a game that came out three years later, you really see the difference in quality. It has great impacts from the attacks, and most importantly, they capture the personality of the characters and while the animations of the characters looks fantastic the actual look of the characters is a bit hit and miss don't get me wrong they definitely look like the characters they're supposed to be but they don't really match up with the style of the manga or the anime many of the models have a great amount of detail but they're too rounded and soft looking also, some of the proportions of the characters' bodies look kind of off. This is most evident with Gohan's model. His limbs just look too long for his body. Then there is the color palette, which is very desaturated. It more closely resembles the colors of the manga rather than the anime. I'm not sure if this is what they're going for, but it makes the characters blend in too much with the backgrounds. 
especially when there is dust and effects overlaid with the characters. The key blasts and effects are very bland. Their colors are very muted and don't really stand out that well. It takes away from the impact of these attacks, which are usually quite a spectacle to see. The auras are even worse. You can barely see them. They're so faint that half the time you won't even notice that they're there. The menus just scream manga. This is why I think the game was trying to do something in between the styles of the manga and the anime. Unfortunately, the half measure of both doesn't really achieve either. Overall, the graphics look clean and reflect the likeness of the characters well. It's just lacking when it comes to meeting the style of Dragon Ball Z. When you start a new game, you'll discover that there is no dedicated tutorial. This is due to the fact that the tutorial is built into the story mode. As you move through the plot, the game's mechanics are gradually introduced to you. Because of this, let's just jump straight into the story mode. Just like in the source material, the story starts off with Goku visiting Kame Island with his young son Gohan. Suddenly, Goku's brother Raditz arrives and kidnaps Gohan. Stop, don't come back. The story is divided into sections, each with its own title card. <laughs> This is pretty cool because it closely resembles the structure of the anime. The first fight begins when Goku and Piccolo track down Raditz. For this first fight, we'll take on the role of Goku. Before we begin, we are given an information card outlining the controls. The gameplay begins simple enough with us being able to punch, kick, guard and throw key blasts. Combos can be performed by combining these actions. Holding a certain direction while doing these actions will also lead the attacks to alter. The grab move is noticeably absent from the basic controls. Because the grab isn't part of a character's baseline skill set, it must be equipped as a special skill. This really threw me off to begin with. I keep trying to grab Raditz but couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. After defeating Raditz we are given a skill capsule. Characters can be equipped with capsules to execute certain attacks and transformations. You can also equip special capsules such as the Sensu Beam. Beam Dad? Yes which can revive you once if you fall in battle. If you're lucky, you may also be rewarded with a Dragon Ball. Unfortunately I never got this lucky. If you collect all seven Dragon Balls, you will be granted one wish, but I never got that lucky. In order for Piccolo to hit Raditz with his special beam cannon, we must play a mini game in which we must rotate the analog stick to move within the blue region. You win if you are in the right place at the right time. It's really easy to overshoot the line, but it's not too difficult overall. Oh, to hell with it! Special beam cannon! <laughs> Is that what you're gonna yell out when you- OH GOD! THE GODS OF LAPITA! DOUBLE KILL! We unlock Raditz who can now be used in the other game modes. All of the characters can be unlocked by playing through the story mode, aside from one. Piccolo hits Raditz and Goku, forever sleeping them both. Goku is sent to the afterlife to train with King Kai in preparation for the invasion of the Saiyans. These cutscenes are excellent. They reproduce the snake way and it looks fantastic. It's just a shame that they only appear in these cutscenes. It would be awesome if there was a mini game for traveling along the snake way or something similar. While the rest of the Z fighters are engaged in battle with Nappa and Vegeta, Goku who is wished back to life by the Dragon Balls and we begin our fight against Nappa. This is the first fight in which we can use the Kaioken technique. In this game it's called King Kai Fist for whatever reason. The fight is quite easy and acts mostly as a warm up for the next battle with Vegeta. I adore the cutscene preceding Vegeta's fight, it's a fantastic recreation. I'll it's at this point that you realize that a lot of the fights end up being very similar. While we are gradually gaining new skills, there isn't enough variation to keep the gameplay from becoming repetitive. While the game's simplicity makes it easy to learn, it also makes it rather limited. Vegeta will proceed to turn into a great ape and attempt to crush Goku. <laughs> Luckily, Yajirobe takes the opportunity to slice off Vegeta's tail, causing him to revert back to his humanoid form. 
back to normal. Go on, we can do this. We can beat him. We have a chance. Because Goku is too injured to battle, we shall take on the role as his son Gohan. He plays mostly the same as his father, although with slightly different moves. The biggest difference is that he has far less health at the start of the fight, but so does Vegeta. This is the last fight of the saga. Well, thought of. But I'll go into that a bit later. Goku decides to spare Vegeta's life and allows him to flee. <laughs> I hate so much about the things that you choose to be. We then get a preview of the next story segment, which is the Freezer Saga. If you go back to the main menu, you'll see that the background image has changed. Each saga has its own artwork. Once Goku has recovered from his injuries, he begins to make his way to the planet Namek. As he journeys through space, he takes the opportunity to train. During this section, we play through a small series of mini games. The first one is simple, we just need to deflect 15 key blasts. To deflect a key blast, you just have to press guard before the blast hits you. The timing is actually way more lenient than it seems. On a side note, the stages that these training mini games take place in is kind of a weird choice. I get that it's supposed to be a simulation of the fight against Vegeta, but it almost feels like you're being teleported back to Earth. I think this section really could have benefited from its own stage. Plus it'd be really cool to have a stage that takes place inside the spaceship. I don't think this series ever got any indoor stages, unless you count the hyperbolic time chamber, but no one does. The second training session, we must activate burst mode five times. It's basically just a struggle and you must press buttons and rotate the analog stick as quickly as possible to win. The feedback of the burst mode is really bad. It's hard to tell how well you're doing and they go on for far too long. Sometimes it just feels random as to whether you're gonna win or not. The third and final training session is to just defeat the fake Vegeta. Landing on Namek, we'll be taking on two members of the Ginyu Force. We are the Ginyu Force! <coughs> First Rakum and then Captain Ginyu. When using powerful key blasts like the Kamehameha, you first must perform a combo. This is really dumb. Especially if you want to launch one from a distance. You first have to throw a few punches into the air and it just looks and feels cumbersome. The Kamehameha in this game is yellow, which is the colour it was depicted as in the manga. Cell is the only character whose Kamehameha is blue. Defeating Captain Ginyu for the first time will cause him to switch bodies with Goku. <laughs> For this next fight, it can be a little bit difficult as we must play as Ginyu and his moveset isn't as good as Goku's. We also begin with a health disadvantage. <laughs> While Goku is healing in the rejuvenation chamber, the other Z fighters struggle to hold off Frieza. Oh fuck. When he is all healed up, we face Frieza in his final form. If it weren't for Frieza, you wouldn't be dying now. The fight plays out pretty much the same as the other fights, although we do have access to more moves like the grab now, so there are a little more options. Goku attempts to take out Frieza using the spirit bomb. But fails and Krillin ends up getting forever sleeped. Enraged, Goku transforms into a Super Saiyan. What the hell is all this about? 
What's up with your hair? What's up with your eyes? Answer me! We start the fight in Super Saiyan form and this is where it becomes really noticeable. One of the most annoying things about this game and that is how fast your key gauge drains. Look at how quickly Goku is knocked out of the Super Saiyan form. It is so annoying. It almost makes it not worth transforming at all because it drains so fast it is so easy to run out of key so you can't perform any of your special moves. You can manually power up by pressing back twice while holding guard. Since you are completely vulnerable while doing this it almost isn't worth taking the extra damage to do so. It's also really hard to tell when Goku is even in his Kaioken state since the auras are so faint. If it wasn't for the fact that the character portrait next to the health bar changes it would be almost impossible to tell. The final fight in the saga is against Freezer once again but this time he is powered up to 100%. If I let him power up to 100% and beat him then he'll demoralize him and he'll never threaten anyone again. Goku that is retarded! It can be quite difficult given your low health and he is quite aggressive. Once losing Super Saiyan form there isn't really enough health to play with to transform again so we end up taking him out using basic combos and grabs. <laughs> Goku manages to escape just in time, and that brings us to the end of the Freezer saga. Why are you the way that you are? Goku speaks with future Trunks who warns him of the android threat that would befall them in three years. He also tells Goku about his heart disease which he will suffer from and hands him the medication to treat it. Is it grape flavored? I don't know, yes? It's because I don't like grape. Then it's bacon flavored. Yay! It jumps ahead three years to when Goku faces off against Android 19. The gimmick for this fight is that Goku's health is constantly decreasing as a result of his heart disease. I've never understood why Goku wasn't taking his medicine to address his heart disease. Because it was great flavor! I mean he waits until he's about to die before he starts taking it. I get that Goku isn't the brightest guy in the world but this is borderline masochistic. Since Goku has passed out for most of this saga <gasps> Oh good, he took a It's up to Piccolo to take care of Cell and make sure he doesn't absorb the androids to achieve his perfect form. Another quirk of this game is the ability to perform skills before having them. You can utilize the fuse with Kami transformation in this fight, but you don't get it until after the fight. This isn't necessarily a mistake though, because the skills are supposed to be utilized outside of the story mode, but it is notable because there are other encounters where you can't use the skills until you earn them. Despite our attempts, Android 17 is eventually absorbed. The plot fast forwards quite a bit with Goku and Gohan having already completed their training in the hyperbolic time chamber. There is a reason why huge chunks of the plot are missing but we're gonna go into that a little bit later. I just came to measure you up and I gotta say, nice. See you in a week. It's a date. Yeah, I know. That's how days work. The Cell games have already begun and we get to face off against Cell in his perfect form. Cell is definitely the most difficult opponent in this mode and we'll have to face him a few more times after this, with him getting progressively stronger. This is the final time we will play as Goku in the story mode. We will swap to Gohan for the final few fights. When we defeat Cell for the first time as Gohan, Cell will forever sleep Android 16 causing Gohan to get enraged, allowing him to turn into Super Saiyan 2. My personal favorite transformation. The fight against Cell Jr. is actually against six Cell Juniors. Luckily it's not all at the same time. When one is defeated, the next one will appear. They each only have one health bar, so it's not quite as bad as it sounds. There are only two more fights left and they're both against Cell. While this is faithful to the source material, it is very repetitive and you don't really get any new moves during this section. Aside from the Super Saiyan 2 transformation, and like I said before, transformations kinda suck. Alright Gohan, I think it's time you brought her home. Hold on, I'm not done ripping the wings off this butterfly. Red flag. Beating the crap out of Cell causes him to vomit up Android 18. <laughs> it's a girl. Mazel 
making him revert back to a semi-perfect form. He decides to blow himself up and take everyone with him because he is a sore loser. By teleporting himself and Cell to King Kai's planet, Goku sacrifices himself and King Kai. Such a gentleman. <laughs> Fuck you, King Kai. That's what Goku thinks of you. <laughs> But it doesn't work and Sal reappears, this time even more powerful. The final battle is by far the toughest in the story mode. The low health is a major disadvantage and because we're starting in Super Saiyan 2, our key drains quickly. Expect to be unable to sustain this state for the duration of the fight because Sal is extremely aggressive, giving no breathing room for charging your key. <laughs> Trunks gets got and we get the best bit of dialogue in the game. すぐに終わらせてやる。地球ごと全てを消してな。ははは。どうした、孫悟飯。最後の抵抗を見せてみろ。あれは抵抗したって無駄なことぐらい分かってる。The iconic father and son Kamehameha scene plays out and Cell is finally defeated for good. Trunks returns to the future and Goku stays forever sleeped. Forever. But not really. No one dies forever in this universe. <laughs> it's too convenient. Budokai's story mode only goes up to the end of the Android Saga, leaving out the Boo Saga entirely. And that's it for the story mode. Well, not really. Once you've completed the story mode for the first time, you'll be able to access the level select. Not only that, but there are more story flights to play through as well. For the most part, the story was told from Goku's point of view during the initial playthrough. These extra fights follow a few of the other characters such as Piccolo as he trains Gohan during the Saiyan Saga I didn't go on by. and Vegeta during the Android Saga. Guess it's just you and me now, black man. This is the reason for all the time skips during our first playthrough. While it's wonderful that you can unlock extra encounters, it seems like the story mode would flow better if they were just in there from the start. I understand wanting to reward a player for completing the game, but the way they've done it detracts from the core experience. Furthermore, there is already another reward that completionists get to enjoy, and those are the what-if scenarios. Each saga features its own what-if scenario, which centers on the saga's major villain. 
When playing as Vegeta after winning all of the fights, Yajirobu will fail to sneak up on Vegeta. Then he remembers Nappa and transforms into a Super Saiyan. <laughs> I'm not sure why thinking of Nappa causes him to transform, considering he was the one that killed him, but yay. For Frieza, winning the fights will allow him to have his wish for immortality granted, and he goes on to destroy Earth and probably everyone else. Pretty simple, but makes sense. Cell's what if scenario is the weirdest one. And also the best. When trying to absorb Android 18, Cell accidentally absorbs Krillin instead. Whoops. Even though it's a really weird concept, I actually really like the design of this form. Yamcha and Tien take revenge on Cell and manage to take him out. <laughs> but it turns out that it was all a dream. See? I told you it was weird. And that concludes the story mode. If you complete all the fights, you will have unlocked all but one of the characters. And in order to unlock him, we'll need to enter world match mode. World match is just the world martial arts tournament mode. I don't know why it's called world match in this game. Maybe it's a translation error, but I honestly don't know. The gameplay is the same as in the main game, but with the added win condition of a ring out system. There are three different tournaments, Novice, Adept and Advanced. If you beat the Adept tournament, you unlock Hercule. Edit skill mode allows you to customize the character's skills by equipping capsules that you earn in the story mode and buying them from Mr. Popo's shop. I really don't like how the shop works in this game because it is randomized aside from the recommended capsule. This is also where you can buy the capsule to unlock the Legend of Hercule mode. It can only be purchased if you have already unlocked Hercule. In the Legend of Hercule mode, you play as Hercule through 11 fights. The final fight is always against Perfect Cell and each fight has its own special requirements such as defeating Vegeta within the time limit to make it to the bathroom. I'm not making this up, it actually is one of the... <laughs> Dual mode allows you to fight against another player or computer. Pretty standard. A strange little tidbit is that the image for this mode depicts Vegeta in his Boo Saga attire, even though this game doesn't cover the Boo Saga. Whoops. Practice mode is a great place to learn the combos and controls of each character. You have infinite health and can set the computer's difficulty on the fly. You can have the combo that you want to practice displayed on the screen and the game will tell you if you have performed it correctly. It's actually a really robust mode that is carried over to the sequels. Budokai 1 is definitely a product of its time. With the exception of the story mode presentation, everything this game does is done better in the sequels. The gameplay is very repetitive and there isn't much variety when it comes to the fights. Most of the characters feel about the same to play and the transformations feel more like an annoyance rather than a reward for playing well. The mini games are a nice addition but they are pretty much dropped in the last half of the game. I wouldn't recommend playing this over Budokai 2 or three. But what about the story mode? Is it worth playing for the story alone? And while I believe this is the best retelling of the anime slash manga in the Budokai games, I would not recommend it for the following reasons. When Budokai 1 was released in 2002, access to the actual anime and manga was extremely limited, especially in New Zealand. I'd have to wait until after school to watch that day's one episode. There were DVDs with three or four episodes that you could get, but they were extremely expensive and the rental store never carried all of them. As a result, playing through this game was one of the most accessible methods to experiencing the Dragon Ball Z story. This is no longer the case thanks to the internet and easy access to various streaming sites. You'll have a much better time if you watch the anime or read the manga. Budokai 1 is not not a bad game. It is an obsolete game.
If you've been around these parts long enough, you probably know that Budokai 2 is somewhat considered the black sheep of the original Budokai trilogy. Could you stop doing that? Could you stop doing that please? So much so that it was left out of the HD re-release in 2012. Although it was never my game of choice when picking a DBZ game, I definitely don't remember it being a bad game. It added a lot to the series and improved on its predecessor in many aspects. I think where the problem lies with this game, at least for me, is that it doesn't really excel at anything. And then there was the story mode, which was my least favourite out of the three by far. You play Budokai 1 for the story mode and Budokai 3 for everything else. But it has been many years since I've played Budokai 2, so is it really the black sheep of the series? Let's find out together. Ghost, stop eating that. Dragon Ball Z Budokai 2 is a fighting game developed by Dimps, the same developers of Budokai 1. It was released in 2003 for the PlayStation 2. The GameCube version was released over a year later for all regions except for Japan, with the original Xbox once again missing out. Oh, no. <laughs> Despite the fact that Japan did not receive a GameCube version, the European GameCube version included the Japanese voiceover. The year between releases allowed the GameCube version to have slightly enhanced graphics, more difficulty options and new costumes. For this retrospective though, we'll be playing through the version that I played as a kid, and that is the PlayStation 2 version. So let us begin. The game begins with a stunningly animated intro. Even today the 2D animation looks wonderful. It depicts the fights of all the series' major villains. I particularly like the representation of the Boo fight. It portrays the battle on a massive scale that the anime never fully achieves. It also includes several of this entry's new characters, such as Goten and Kid Trunks, as well as the fusion ability. It's a terrific method to show the player what they can anticipate in the game in an entertaining way without giving away everything. The music is well synced with the visuals and is energetic, which will get you geared up for the game. This opening is fantastic, yet it does have its quirks. The characters look slightly off model somehow. It's hard to place. I guess it's more that the art style looks closer to Dragon Ball Super than to Dragon Ball Z, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, just different. There is also the case of Vegeta's brown hair, which seems to pop up from time to time, and then Goten's ankle bands that change colour between shots. Now these things do not matter at all, I just thought they were kind of interesting. One of the most noticeable improvements Budokai 2 makes over the first game is the graphics. The GameCube release of Budokai 1 attempted to emulate a cell shading style, but because that game wasn't built from the ground up with that style in mind, it wasn't really able to achieve it. Budokai 2 did, however, succeed where its predecessor did not. The cell shading looks incredibly crisp and vibrant. It's the perfect style for this game, and I'm glad that they adjusted their approach to 3D model designs to have sharper features and lines. The characters look extremely close to their anime and manga counterparts, apart from the faces. They look bad, and the shading on them is too dark. Also, Piccolo looks like he has no pupils in the character select screen, and his skin colour looks too dark of green. Although, I do kind of like the way he looks. Key Blasts have been enhanced. They are much more bright and have better coloration. They don't quite live up to the spectacle of the anime or Budokai 3, but it's a huge improvement over the original. Although the Key Blasts improve significantly, the same cannot be said about the auras. They still look way too faint. They're quite difficult to see, and the same issue I have with them in the first game persists in this game. Once again, the main issue is with the transformations. They just don't feel as powerful as they should due to the lack of a striking aura. The problem with the Kaioken remains. Other than the portrait, it's impossible to discern when Goku is in this state. It's a shame that this wasn't addressed because it actually does have a negative effect on the gameplay. 
The stages look fantastic as well. They are quite simple which works in the game's favour because it allows the characters to stand out from their environment. The snowy mountain stage is my favourite since it has a really stunning snow effect. I'm not a fan of how the HUD looks. This may sound strange but I believe it looks too cartoony. Yeah, Dragon Ball Z is technically a cartoon and Budokai 2 is striving to mimic its style, but this health bar is out of place. It displays the information clearly and cleanly, but the aesthetic is simply incorrect. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. It bothers me. It bothers me a lot. All the menus in this game are really boring. They're so plain compared to Budokai 1's awesome manga inspired menus. It almost looks unfinished, like this is a placeholder until the real one's done. But it never got done. The music is awesome. It carries over a few tracks from Budokai 1 but also adds in many great tracks of its own. It amps up the action and gives the Budokai series a distinct flair. It is extremely nostalgic, at least for me anyway. Unlike in Budokai 1, where the game's mechanics are slowly introduced and taught to the player as they progress through the story mode, Budokai 2 has its own dedicated tutorial mode. It's framed as a training session between Goten and various other Z fighters. Each fighter will explain the actions and then have Goten perform said actions. When they are performed correctly, the tutorial moves on. It is separated into chapters with a brief explanation of what will be taught in each chapter. It's very simple, yet very effective. The actions are clearly defined and the controls are located at the bottom of the screen, making it very clear which button performs what. When you are prompted to do a combo, it will be presented at the bottom as well. It does an excellent job of introducing new players to the game's controls and mechanics, while also serving as a great refresher for experienced players. While I did like how Budokai 1 integrated the tutorial into the story mode, it does make the first few fights a little tedious and boring. I believe Budokai 2's method is far superior because it provides more guidance for those who require it and can be fully avoided by those who do not. The controls are fairly similar to the previous title. You can punch, kick, guard and throw key blasts. By performing these actions in a sequence you can execute combos. You can also deflect basic key blasts if you can get the timing right. One of the best changes they made was making the grab a part of a character's basic move set. Thank god. They also made it so if you want to perform a finishing move, such as the Kamehameha, you don't need to throw a few punches in order to do so. This makes doing ranged attacks way less awkward. You can manually charge your key gauge allowing you to unleash additional key blasts and perform powerful finishing moves. These are characters ultimate attacks. They are more powerful and can be charged by rotating the analog stick. Unfortunately there are only a few variations of this technique so expect to see numerous characters use the same animations. To dodge attacks or to get behind your opponent, you can strafe forward and back between planes. Dashing forward can be used to close in on your opponent and to also perform a dash attack to break their guard. Strangely, you cannot dash backwards, which is the kind of weird omission. Burst mode makes a return and I'm pretty sure it's worse in this game. Or maybe I'm just really bad at them. It's a mystery. Not really. When both sides collide, burst mode is activated. In order to win the battle, you must rapidly press buttons. But I swear this doesn't work half the time. It, it can't be me, it has to be the game. I was pressing them so quickly, like two handing the buttons, and I don't think I ever won one. Not once. <laughs> there is no indication of how well you're doing. All you can do is mash buttons and hope you're doing enough. Fortunately, for me, they don't happen very often, so you can get through the fights without mastering burst limit. Transformations have returned and thankfully they are considerably more manageable this time. They don't deplete your key as much as they did in the first game, so you can utilise them without jeopardising your ability to perform special attacks. Strangely enough, they omitted the inclusion of Freezer and Sal's various forms and only features Sal's perfect form and Freezer's final form. Well, I guess it's not entirely true, there is Mecha Freezer. That you can unlock. But other than that, the other ones, ow, the other ones are not in the game. That's weird. Newly added to the series is the ability to perform fusions. There are two types of fusions in the game. 
Fusion Dance is a temporary fusion that can be performed during a fight by launching your opponent into the air and successfully following the button prompts. If the transformation is successful, the key gauge is replaced with a timer. When in this form, you have unlimited key until the timer runs out and the fusion will end. If you mess up the button prompts, the fusion will result in this. <laughs> God, what the fuck is that? When in this state, your attacks are way less effective. The timer does run down a lot faster though, so the game does show you some mercy. I really love this little addition, and it really sucks that they took it out of Budokai 3. It is quite punishing, but it's also really funny, so I consider that a fair trade. Patara fusions are more permanent. After launching your opponent into the air, you must hit a button. If your opponent hits a different button than you, the fusion will be successful. Unlike the other fusions, you retain your key gauge and remain fused until the end of the fight. The game features the canon fusions such as Gotenks, Vegito and Kabito Kai, but it also features a couple of what if fusions. Tien Chi is the fusion of Tien and Yancha. Ah! Ah! Then there's Goku, which is the fusion of Goku and Hercule. Oh, Depending on which outfits you choose, Goku will actually have two completely different physical forms. Oh, oh, no. Now I'm not really sure if this counts as a fusion or a transformation, but there is also Boo Absorptions. In Budokai 2, Super Boo has an ability called Absorption that allows you to absorb a character other than your opponent during the battle. Boo can absorb six different characters, Tien and Yamcha, Gohan, Super Saiyan 3 Gotenks, Frieza, Cell, and Vegeta. Depending on the character he has absorbed will change his special attack. Budokai 2 contains a ton of new features and improves on the gameplay of Budokai 1. The changes are immediately noticeable as you have more options in a fight and your movement is much smoother. However, it still has a few flaws such as the tedious button combinations and button mashing attacks that tend to dominate the combat. Budokai 2's combat is undeniably superior to its predecessor, but what about its game modes? Budokai 2's story mode is called Dragon World, and it is the worst story mode in the trilogy by far. It's not even close. Boy, that escalated quickly. While Budokai 1 was a very cinematic affair, with a lot of cutscenes retelling the story, and Budokai 3 being more focused on adventure with an overworld map, Budokai 2 decides to go with a board game. It's a strange choice, and while the board game setup isn't necessarily a bad idea, the way it was executed is. After selecting Dragon World Mode, you will be launched into an intro telling about Goku and his quest for the Dragon Balls, and then the first stage begins. Two Saiyan spaceships will crash into Earth, with Nappa and Raditz disembarking. Those familiar with the Dragon Ball Z story are probably confused, as Nappa doesn't arrive on Earth until a full year after Raditz. Hi! Well, don't expect Budokai 2 to faithfully follow the Dragon Ball Z story because there is a lot of situations like this. This is an interesting concept as it allows the game to have some freedom in telling the story in a unique way. Budokai 1 also had a similar thing with its what if scenarios. Unfortunately, the game does nothing with this. In fact, it does almost nothing with the story at all. Many of the iconic moments from the series are missing, like Piccolo and Goku teaming up against Raditz, gone. Goku's first transformation into Super Saiyan, mm -hmm. Vegeta and Goku's showdown, nope. One of the main reasons that this is the worst story mode in the series is simply because it doesn't really tell the story. Yes, it does have small character interactions, but they are very brief and the animations are very bland and are mostly just characters cycling through poses while talking. Whereas with Budokai 1, you could follow the story fairly well, even if you weren't that familiar with the source material. With Budokai 2, however, you have no chance. Good luck with that. Come eat that horse with me, Vegeta. What the hell are you on about? Even I got confused at what was even going on. 
For instance, when entering the second stage, you're placed on a board with a snowy background and Freezer is there in his final form with Captain Ginyu and it's like, what? Alright, alright, I have already lost the plot completely. There is so much wrong with this, but the game never addresses it at all. This is not another planet, this is on Earth, as you can see a crashed Red Ribbon army plane in the background. This is such a missed opportunity. The whole story mode could have been made up of interesting what if scenarios but instead we get this. We have Freezer on Earth for some reason. It's never brought up by any other characters, the game never tries to explain it. He's just there and you fight him and that's it. Shit. So we have established that the story presentation is abysmal, but this isn't even the worst thing about the story mode. No, that would be the tedium of it all. Dragon World is designed to be played through multiple times if you want to unlock everything. This is not the issue as there are many games that do this and it can be really fun to go through a game again once you have mastered the mechanics. The issue comes from the mode structure. You control Goku and one or two other characters whom you choose as your partner at the beginning of a stage. You are on a board that has many spaces and green lines. You move your characters along the green lines to the spaces. There are also pieces for your enemies as well. When it's your turn you select one of your characters and move them to another spot. Your main goal is usually to defeat a specific enemy. When you and your enemy meet up on the same space, you go into a fight. In order to eliminate an enemy from the board, you must fight them multiple times. This is so tedious. Sometimes you have to fight the same opponent four or five times. Both Freezer and Cell are reused so much throughout this mode that they become so annoying to face that you actively try to avoid interacting with them because you've fought them so much. And it really feels like... Does that mean I win? Yes! Yes! You win! <gasps> what do I win? <laughs> yeah, so in case it wasn't clear, I'm not exactly a fan of this mode. That's an understatement. But it's not all bad. You can pick up items that will improve your character's stats during the stage to help speed up the fights. The daggers will increase a character's attack by 10 to 40%. A high attack means you are able to inflict more damage in battles. And picking up armor will receive a defense boost ranging from 10 to 30%. Hey look Vegeta, I'm you! Paragon till death! You ruined it. You ruined it and I'm leaving. A higher defense means that you will take less damage from attacks. You also get a boost when you land on the same space as one of your allies, but I'm not really sure what stat is getting boosted exactly because it's not really that clear. Wow, you guys sure got strong, huh? That's right, Kakarot. And you wouldn't believe just how much. You see, while I was training in the depths of the hyperbolic time chamber, I looked deep within myself and blah 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 pride, blah blah prince of all, blah 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 super saiyan, blah blah blah. Zenny can also be found on the board. This is the game's currency which can be used to purchase new skill capsules in the skills shop. Capsules can also be found on the boards. The capsule system works pretty much the same as it did in Budokai 1. You can equip up to 7 capsules to a character, each of which grants them the power to perform specific attacks and transformations. There are other capsules that offer specialised buffs and debuffs, such as the heart virus capsule which constantly drains the health of a character who has the capsule equipped. However, not all capsules are created equal since some will occupy more than one slot, and certain capsules can only be equipped by certain characters. The capsule system can be inconvenient. It's nice that you can customise each character to fit your playstyle, but the limited slot count gives little room for special moves, especially if you wish to use transformations. To utilise Super Saiyan 3 for example, you must first equip Super Saiyan and Super Saiyan 2. That's 3 of the 7 slots already taken. Yet, there is a workaround, and that is the Breakthrough Capsules. In the Budokai series, the Breakthrough Capsules is a special item that allows the equipped character to use all of their moves during a fight. The only disadvantage is that it takes up all 7 slots, preventing you from equipping buffing or debuffing capsules. You must wish for these capsules from Shinran in order to get them. To summon Shinran though, we must first collect all 7 Dragon Balls. And how can we achieve this? It's actually fairly simple but also not at the same time. The first Dragon Ball is always in the same location. However, later on, you can pick up the Dragon Radar, which will indicate to you which space the Dragon Ball is in. So you navigate to that location and discover that there is nothing there. Hmm. That's because you have to dig for it, but the game does a terrible job of informing the player of this. 
The only way to find out is to wait for the control explanation to appear. There it is. It wouldn't surprise me if someone played through the entire story mode without realising you could do this. When digging you can find more than just Dragon Balls. Onions are occasionally found. If you dig it up, the character who discovers it will gain an extra move for the rest of the stage. As an example, Gohan only has one move limit, therefore he can only move one space. He'll be able to move two spaces per turn with the onion. You can also dig up Zenny, attack boosts and defence boosts. Keep in mind that all of these items that I've talked about can also be picked up by your opponents. So you need to work around their board movements in order to make sure you get the items you want. Besides items, you'll also see red spaces with symbols, which symbolise special battle conditions you will face if you fight there. There are five different types of spaces. On the half health space, your health gauge and your enemy's health gauge will start at half of their normal. On the drain heart space, both fighters' health will constantly decrease during the battle. The no blocking means your ability to guard is disabled. Zero key space means you'll start with zero key. You can still power up to restore it. On the drain key space, it means your key will be constantly drained even if you aren't transformed. These spaces can add some variety to the gameplay, but because they affect both you and your opponent, they don't add much of a challenge. Maybe if it was only applied to one side, it would be more worth trying to land on them. Mr. Popo is a teleport space that will send you to a predetermined space on the board. Nobody is thankful, there are no days off and no one ever visits. And finally, there is Den Day spaces. Ball. <gasps> is this a dragon what's it? Where am I? Who are you? Where's my family? Hey. Each fighter has five green blocks next to them that reflect his or her health. If the boxes are dark green, it means that they are empty. To fill the boxes, go to Dende Space, which will restore one bar for you. Goku will always begin the stage with 3 HP, and will have a maximum of 5. If you win a fight, your opponent loses 1 HP. If you win and your opponent does not lose all of their health, a day's symbol will appear above them. If you defeat them again while the symbol is there, they will lose 2 HP instead of just 1. However, if you lose a fight, you'll be knocked back a space and lose 1 HP. And when you refight that opponent again, their health will be reduced to the nearest gauge that you drop them down to, making them easier to take out. This is kind of unfair because that's not what happens to you. You always start with full health, unless you are on a half health space. We've gone over most of the board's mechanics, but there's still the question of how do we unlock characters? Because there are quite a few to unlock. And that's where picking your partner on the board becomes very, very important. In order to unlock certain characters, for example Raditz, he must be defeated by Goku. Defeating him with any other character will not unlock him. You can also unlock Nappa in the first stage, but only by defeating him with Vegeta. Vegeta, on the other hand, cannot be unlocked until stage 3. As a result, unlocking Nappa on your first playthrough is impossible. This is why Dragon World must be played multiple times in order to unlock everything. Some are really obvious, like Goku defeating Frieza unlocks him, but others are a little more obscure and annoying. To unlock the Great Saiyan Man, you must only fight Cell as Gohan. If any other character fights him, then too bad, you won't unlock him. You'll have to restart the stage. This is the most tedious part of the mode. Going through the same fights over and over just so you can get the characters that you want. Some stages, especially the later ones, really start to drag out with a heap of Cybermen and Cell Juniors littering the board. You have to power your way through them just to advance. It's not like they're challenging in any way. Well, maybe I guess to my patience. The Cybermen only sport one health bar each. They're just there to pad out the gameplay to waste your time. To complete Dragon World, you must play through nine stages. It covers all of the sagas, including the Boo Saga. Each stage has its own objective for you to complete in order to progress. Most of the time, it just requires you to defeat a certain enemy on the board. Most of the fights aren't that hard, but there is a noticeable difficulty spike when you fight Kid Boo. He is like 
on drugs or something. It's like, Jesus Christ. Like I said before, Budokai 2 story mode is my least favorite in the series. The health system really brings down the pacing, making you have to face off against the same character multiple times in a row. It definitely has a lot of replayability, but when it's repeated playthroughs that I don't really enjoy, it's hard to hold this point in the game's favor. <laughs> Babidi's fate spit. <laughs> Babidi's spaceship is unlocked by collecting seven Dragon Balls and wishing for it from Shenron. It's a mode that consists of four different fighting themed mini games. As you play the mini games, you'll earn Killy, which will be added up after each game. Once you reach a certain amount, you'll be awarded either capsules or characters. In stage one, you will select a character and the opponent to face. The aim here is to fight your opponent, but he will only have one health gauge. And if you defeat him, Babidi will revive him. Essentially, it's an endurance test in which you try to defeat your opponent as many times as you can before he defeats you. The more you knock out, the more killy you will earn. For stage two, you just have to try and stay alive for as long as possible by guarding and dodging your opponent's attacks. In stage 3, your goal is to land as many hits on your opponent as possible before the time runs out. The more hits you get, the more killer you gain. Finally, stage 4 requires you to volley as many key blasts as you can within the time limit. If you're just attempting to unlock everything as quickly as possible, this is the stage that you want to play because it awards the most killy. The addition of Babidi's spaceship is fantastic. The mini games are entertaining and provide a welcome change of pace to the gameplay without deviating too far from the core mechanics. The dueling mode is fairly standard. It allows you to compete against the computer or against another player using any custom skills. If you like, you can also watch a fight between two computer controlled characters, but I'm not sure why you'd want to, but you can. An improved version of the World Tournament mode returns for Budokai 2. We have the three basic modes of Novice, Adept and Expert, each having progressively more rounds. You can win matches by knocking your opponent out of the ring or lowering their health to zero. The ring is a bit bigger in this game, making the threat of ring outs not as daunting. Tournaments are the best way to earn Zenny. Winning a tournament or coming runner up will award you with a bunch of Zenny to spend at the skills shop. They kept the practice mode from the first game and it's still really good. You can pretty much set up a battle any way you like, all from the menu. You may even tell the computer if you want it to fight back or not. A window at the bottom of the screen displays the buttons you just pressed. Very useful for memorizing and learning the timing of specific combinations of attacks. You can also practice against a friend if you have a second controller and a friend. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Dragon Ball Z Budokai 2 was always my least favorite of the original trilogy. And after playing it again, after all these years, it still is. If I were judging this game on the gameplay alone, Budokai 2 is far superior to that of Budokai 1. It improves practically every aspect of the controls and fighting mechanics. The new improvements all work well and contribute to the overall quality of the gameplay. It includes a ton of extra characters and fusions to unlock that any Dragon Ball Z fan would love. The visuals are stunning and accurately emulate the style of the Dragon Ball Z anime. The story mode on the other hand really drags the game down. It doesn't have the same amount of care as the first installment. It feels rushed and extremely repetitive. Every family has its black sheep and for this series it's Budokai 2. This game is kind of weird and not always in a good way. Could you stop doing it? Could you stop doing it please? That's actually quite scary. <laughs> In 2004, the Japanese gaming magazine V-Jump announced their limited edition version of Dragon Ball Z 2, also known as Dragon Ball Z Budokai 2 in other regions. This limited edition was titled Dragon Ball Z 2 V. The V stands for Very Rare. Okay fine, it actually stands for V-Jump. But this game is very rare, with there only being 2,000 copies in the entire world, meaning that most people will never get to own this game. But honestly, when I looked up this game on eBay, it wasn't as expensive as I was expecting. Don't get me wrong, I still can't afford it. I mean, look at my clothes. I don't have any money. But when compared to a game like Team KH2 that has hundreds of thousands of copies out there, it seems kind of underpriced. So how did players get their hands on this game? 
Well, to put it simply, I don't know. Hold on a second. Now this isn't for a lack of trying, but I just couldn't find anywhere how this game was given out. A lot of websites would say that it was distributed via the magazine, but they didn't say how. Though I did find an image of the V Jump page advertising the game, and using a really, really rough translation, I think it was distributed through a lottery. So my theory is that subscribers to V Jump magazine were put into a draw to win a copy, but that is only a guess. An educated guess, but still a guess. How is Dragon Ball Z 2V different from the regular version of Budokai 2? Well, in terms of the game mechanics, it's not different at all. The game modes are the same, the capsule system is still here, and the graphics and sound have seen no change, from the Japanese release at least. I bring this up because the Japanese version does have some features that were not in the international PS2 version of Budokai 2. So I'm going to go over them quickly here. Goku got a damage costume, Piccolo has his cape and turban costume, Kyuriza makes his first appearance ever in a video game, though he is just an alternate costume for Frieza. When Frieza's spaceship ability is triggered, he will change into his final form. There is also a tenth stage added to the story mode that can be played after beating Kid Buu. The first change you'll notice from the original release is the cover. See? The logo is different. On a side note, the Japanese covers of the Budokai games are so much better than what we got. Look at how cool the Japanese Budokai 1 cover is, and this is what we got in New Zealand. Anyway, not only is the logo different on the cover, but it also gives a hint to what has been added to this version. And that is, Cooler has been added as a playable character. Kind of. He isn't actually a separate character, but rather an alternate costume for Freezer which means he doesn't have his own unique moveset. He doesn't even have his own character portrait. Cooler isn't the only new costume added to Freezer. You can now play as Margin Freezer. Yay, my favorite. <coughs> Cell also got his Margin form too. Great Saiyaman has the key control, mixed blood power, and sane heritage support capsule added. A new difficulty has been added. There is now a Z2 difficulty, which is... <coughs> Very hard. The World Martial Arts Tournament stage has the V-Jump logo on the floor. There's also another version of the stage that has the V-Jump logo and block letters on the wall. The title screen has been changed slightly with the new logo, but they did not change the logo during the opening cinematic. That's fucking wrong. When playing Dragon Ball Z 2V, you are unable to save the game. Now you're probably thinking, what the hell is this 1980s shit? You can't save? What's the point of that? Well, you can't save because you don't need to save, because the game comes already 100% completed. That's right, all of the characters and all of the capsules are available to use from the get-go. This makes the story mode a lot more fun, because you have access to more options from the very start. Although, because you can't save, you do need to complete your playthrough all in one go. As a collector's item, this version seems pretty cool. It's got nice cover art and the manual looks awesome. Other than that, it's nothing that special. When I was a kid, there was a video rental store that my family and I would frequent pretty much every week. And that store was called United Video. In the 90s and early 2000s, video rental stores were prevalent throughout New Zealand, allowing customers to rent out movies and games for a small fee. As a kid, this was amazing as I didn't have much money and these stores allowed me to experience game franchises that I still love to this day that I otherwise never would have gotten to play. My family were not rich by any means and we couldn't afford every console that was coming out during this time. But my mum was smart with the family budget and one year, for my birthday, I was gifted a PlayStation 2 memory card. You see, I missed out an important part to my story. For at United Video, you could also rent out video game consoles. So for $8, I would get out a PlayStation 2 console along with two games. And those two games that I'd almost always get out was Kingdom Hearts and Dragon Ball Z Budokai.
let us begin. Let's go into practice mode where I will go over the basics of the gameplay. Budokai 3 is a side-on fighting game. You can move side to side using the directional controls. Also, you are able to move between 3D planes by pressing the guard button while holding the directional controls either towards or away from the camera. To dash forward or back, you simply double tap and hold in whichever direction you choose. All characters have the same basic set of actions punch, kick and grab. Using these actions, each character has their own list of combos they can perform. Punches and kicks can be mixed into combos to create different combinations. The forward and back motions can also change some of the attacks. Along with standard punches and kicks, you are able to launch key blasts at your opponent, as long as you have enough key in your key gauge which is displayed under the character's health bar. There are seven bars in total. The larger bars represent the character's baseline key. When key is below baseline, it slowly rises back up to baseline. When it is above, key slowly drops down to baseline. You can fill your key quickly by powering up, done by holding guard, pressing back twice, and then holding back. You will, however, be completely vulnerable to attacks. Blocking is done by pressing and holding the guard button. Blocking does not negate all damage, but while blocking attacks, you will gain a little bit of key to fill your gauge. Certain moves such as grabs, ultimate launches, and fully charged power attacks are unable to be blocked, while dash attacks are able to break through a guard. So you have to be mindful as to whether to block or dodge. The dodge is performed using the same button as blocking, but instead it is tapped rather than held down. Dodging will consume a small amount of key, however the trade-off means you will avoid all damage. These are just the fundamentals of the gameplay, and I'll go over the other aspects as they crop up. Oh yeah, if it wasn't obvious, the fighter who depletes the opponent's health bar first wins. Okay, you got it? Of course we'll start with my favourite mode, Dragon Universe, which also acts as the game's story mode. The story mode spans the Saiyan Saga all the way to the end of the Boo Saga, as well as several of the Dragon Ball Z films and a little bit of GT. There are a variety of characters to choose from. What portion of the story you witness will vary depending on which fighter you choose. However, not all of the characters you can unlock have their own story mode. You will be able to play a total of 11 characters, with 6 of them available at the very start. Since he is the main character, let's start this playthrough as Goku. Long, long ago. Goku had many adventures while searching for the seven magic Dragon Balls. With his trusted friends by his side, Goku successfully battled many powerful foes until... The Earth was attacked by a mysterious warrior race, and so a new battle begins. Hmm, yeah. I don't really like how this story does hard cuts, and it does them quite a lot, as you'll soon see. And here we receive our first capsule, which is the Kamehameha. The capsule system is utilized to give your character skills and items. You can choose up to 7 skills or items, each of which can take up 1 to 7 slots depending on the skill. Now this was my absolute favorite part of this game as a kid. The ability to freely fly around the world map, and I use freely very liberally in this sense because you cannot ascend or descend but you are able to speed up to breakneck pace just like in the anime you can fly to points of interest all around the map using this ability the main story events are marked with a red dot but flying around will also reveal secondary events and objectives some are more obvious than others such as those that take place in a city or near other notable landmarks others are more difficult to locate since they seem to be placed in the middle of nowhere. Oh, and this game also does another thing where not all of the dialogue is voiced, but a lot of it is. I get not having voice for the optional and side missions, 
but sometimes the main story isn't voiced and it's kind of jarring. There are also battle points found in each level. This one is a fight against the Cyberman, the same guy who is in the loading screen. Most of the time when you fight these guys, you will need to defeat multiples. You can fight these battles as many times as you like to farm for experience points. That's right, this game has a level up system. After winning a battle, you will receive experience. With each new level reached, you will be rewarded with a skill point that you can invest into one of seven attributes. Health represents the amount of health your character will have when the battle begins. Key indicates the amount of key your character uses when executing key-based techniques. It has an impact on your key consumption as well. Attack will determine the amount of damage that your character does with their physical attacks. Guard will decide how well your character defends against an attack from the opponent. Arts will increase the damage for special moves. Ability will increase the effectiveness of equipped capsules and equipment. And finally we come to COM. COM stands for computer. At least I think it does. Unless it stands for something else. The higher this rating is, the better the character fares when used by the computer when you lose control of your character, or when the character is being used by the computer. This stat is mostly tied to the online element of the game, and I'm going to be going over this a little bit later in the video. We fight a Cyberman one more time and gain another level. Next we head over to the World Tournament and fight Tien. Alright, this should be pretty easy. But, ah, what the hell Tien? I thought we were friends. Oh, no, hyper mode. Maybe if I make it that he can't hit me. Oh, ha. Now's my chance. Oh no! No more games! Ha! Idiot. Now it's time for my glorious comeback. So a lot happened in that fight. Halfway through the fight, you saw that Tien entered a state called Hyper Mode. Entering this mode makes a character glow red. Key slowly depletes, but Key Blast, Punches and Kicks have no effect on the character. Hyper Mode ends when all Key runs out or when starting Dragon Rush. After a knockback attack in Hyper Mode, you can activate Dragon Rush. The four buttons Square, Triangle, X and Circle direct both characters through a three stage sequence. If the attacker presses a button that the defender does not, the game goes to the following stage, with the defender taking damage. If the attacker guesses the same as the defender, Dragon Rush ends. Yes! First try! On the World Tournament stage, you are able to knock your opponent out of the ring as an alternative win state. While flying around, you can enter a kind of focus mode. A blue aura will elope the entire screen. If there is an area of interest nearby, it will emit a bright glow, making it easy to find extra items and even Dragon Balls. Here we manage to find the Dragon Radar, which makes collecting all the Dragon Balls a lot easier. Of course, finding all seven Dragon Balls does grant you a wish. And after all that, we finally start the first main story fight. You're a complete disgrace, Kakarot! Where is your Saiyan pride? My name is Goku, and I'm from Earth. I'll never join forces with you! Out! Take this, brother from another mother. Although I do think we actually have the same mother. What the fuck am I talking about? After defeating Raditz, you can see we unlocked a story reenactment reward. You get them by fulfilling certain criteria during a fight, such as this one where we just had to use the Kamehameha against Raditz. Why? 
Quite you. My partners are already on their way. They'll destroy you all. <laughs> well, I guess this is it, guys. But I'll keep training in the next world. Wish me back to life in one year. What a huge power level! Time to see if all my training with King Kai paid off. Uh, I did not edit that at all. Uh, so in case you are completely confused by that scene, this is what happened. While Goku holds Raditz in place, Piccolo, who made no appearance in the game's version of events, uses a Ki Blast to kill Raditz, but it also kills Goku. Goku dies. Raditz warns them that more Saiyans are coming just before he dies. Goku goes to the afterlife and runs all the way to the end of Snake Way, where he trains with King Kai. A year later, Goku is wished back using the Dragon Balls just in time to fight off the new Saiyan threat. Okay, did you get the... Did the Maxis GD clarification? This is one of the biggest problems the story mode has a lack of context. If you haven't watched most of the anime or read the manga, then good fucking luck trying to follow this. It's told as a kind of bullet pointed version of the story, but because of the way Dragon Universe is set out, you don't always see every aspect of the story depending on the characters. So it's like half the bullet points are actually missing so it doesn't make any sense and sometimes the characters bring up things that make no sense or just flat out didn't happen could this be a legendary super saiyan the future trunks warned us about what no he didn't you you're hercule's daughter the lookout has become too dangerous find somewhere else to hide piccolo what are you on about we're not even at the lookout Corrin! Take this with you. Uh, oh, oops. Sorry, Corrin. Oh. What the hell was that? Now that Goku has been resurrected from his forever sleep, by talking to King Kai, we receive our first transformation. You have learned well, Goku. Your KO Ken technique surpasses even my own. The majority of characters in this game can transform. These states will alter your character's attack, guard and key baseline values. And some will even unlock new moves. When you meet certain key requirements, you are able to transform your character. The stronger the transformation, the higher key amount you will need to have. If you're in contact with your opponent when you perform the transformation, you'll break their guard. When hit with less than one key gauge, some transformations can be reversed back to their default stage. For example, any Super Saiyan transformation or Gohan's and Krillin's unlocked potential, while others cannot. For example, Freezer and Sal's transformations, Cooler's transformation, or Broly's legendary Super Saiyan transformation. I'll say this once. Leave now! Otherwise, I'll have no choice but to destroy you. Who do you think you are? You think you're any match for me? This is one of those weird instances where it feels like this should be voiced, but it isn't for some reason. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy taking my time with you, Kakarot. We'll see about that. I might just have a few surprises in store for you. Uh oh. As long as I can keep him away. God damn it. Oh yeah, I can transform now. Now you're in for it. Now die! What you saw at the end there was a beam struggle. When you and your opponent launch a key blast at the same time, you will enter a beam struggle. Whoever rotates the left analog stick the fastest will win the struggle. The same thing can happen with physical attacks, but I only managed to trigger it three times throughout all my recorded playthroughs. What 
now I am the prince of all Saiyans, humbled by a clown. Awesome, so we unlock Vegeta and with that this ends the Saiyan Saga and we move on into the Freezer Saga. Having successfully fended off the Saiyan Onslaught, Goku opts to spare Vegeta's life. Mark my words, you'll pay for this Kakarot, you and all of your friends! Krillin, Gohan, and Bulma travel to Namek in the hopes of reviving their fallen friends. Now before we do- Once there, uh, they confront uh. the evil Frieza, who is also searching for the Dragon Balls. Helpless against Frieza's might, they have no choice but to join forces with Vegeta. Meanwhile, Goku has healed and is headed for Namek in a ship built by Bulma's father. His efforts to recover the Dragon Balls frustrated, Frieza summons the Ginyu Force. Can young Gohan survive against the Ginyu Force and Frieza? Will Goku make it in time? Now before we do any of the main events, we are going to find all the Dragon Balls in the area. There should be two. There's the first one. Well, I guess it's the third one, but actually it really is the first one. We fight the battle point a couple of times and level up. And we go to the first main fight in the saga, which is against Raccoon from the Ginyu Force. We are the Ginyu Force! This part here is strange because it seems like the original idea was for you to fight him but maybe his character was cut so you don't fight but you still level up. This happens a couple of more times in Ten and Yamcha's campaigns. And next up is Captain Ginyu. As you can probably tell by now the Dragon Universe is just a bunch of fights surrounded by a retelling of the anime and manga. As a fan of the Dragon Ball franchise I appreciate this approach as if it was just fight after fight, I wouldn't find it as engaging, especially for someone like me who isn't a huge lover of fighting games. At last, we face the big baddie of the saga, Frieza. You're Frieza? Funny, I always thought you'd be taller. Wait, I know that face. Where have I seen him before? As Goku, you will only ever get to fight him in his final form. Only playing through other characters' campaigns will the game pit you against his other transformations. Some stages do have destructible elements, but you do need to knock your opponent into the right area in order for them to activate. I wasted the skill point by putting it into com because I didn't actually know that's what the stat did when I was playing. I was too lazy to Google it. No! This is not good! Oh, sorry. It's... it's Frieza! You miserable pests! You've caused me pain! And for that, you will all pay! Uh, uh... No, stop it! Frieza! Goku! You've destroyed so many innocent lives already! And now, Krillin too! Yes! Now we can transform into a Super Saiyan. Probably the most iconic transformation in the series. Ugh. And with that, the dramatic tension is lost. I guess they need to boot you out so you can equip the transformation, but they could have just done it automatically. I mean they do that at other points in the game, like when Vegeta turns into Margin Vegeta. Why not here? It's so close to being right, but it just isn't for some reason. Anyways, let's continue. I won't forgive you, Frieza! Just what? What are you? I am the hope of the universe. 
the voice of all the innocent lives you destroyed. I am Goku, and I am a Super Saiyan! Now say you're sorry! Are you sorry yet? As a result of Frieza's defeat, we acquire another level and Frieza is unlocked as a playable character. Give up your evil ways, Frieza. Otherwise, we'll meet again. This can't be happening. It can't be. Gohan and the others return safely to Earth, thanks to the Namekian Dragon Balls. However, Goku remains on Namek to resolve things with Frieza. The battle is so intense that the planet itself begins to crumble. Thinking there was no way Goku could have survived, Bulma tries to wish him back to life. However, the wish is refused. Goku survives, and he relays a message that he will return by himself. With everyone alive again, Gohan waits impatiently for his father's return. Now, because Goku is... Oh, a year damn it. Why Goku doesn't it just play the whole thing at once? <gasps> no, don't start it again. Don't. Almost a year has passed since Goku's friends learned of his survival. Suddenly, a terrible power is felt approaching Earth. Frieza. And without Goku to save it, the Earth appears to be doomed. However, a mysterious youth appears and makes short work of Frieza. When Goku returns, the youth claims to be the son of Bulma and Vegeta from the future. warns them of a looming threat, deadly androids that will appear in three years' time. Now because Goku spends the majority of the android and cell saga in bed, suffering from heart disease, How's he doing in there? He's doing fine! Ah! He's doing fine! As Goku, there is only one major story fight in the saga. Hey look, it's Trunks' time machine. And it's a fight with Metal Cooler. Wait, what? Wasn't Metal Cooler on you, Namek? How do you get here? Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Well, okay, then I guess we are fighting Cooler for some reason. Why do we both blow up? Despite my complaining, he does give a decent amount of experience. Not quite enough to level up, though. We find the three-star Dragon Ball in the middle of the ocean and head over to the fighting arena to fight Perfect Cell. Well then, how about we get right to the main event? If you insist. Although I was hoping to save the best for last. Just like with Freezy, you only fight his final form as Goku, with other characters facing his other forms in their story campaigns. Ah, oh, I lost. Right then, let's try this on for size. Are you serious? What? That doesn't count. But Goku loses this fight in the anime. No. Oh. Okay, I've definitely got him this time. No! What? The computer 
is cheating. It glitched my controller. Sight. Why won't you die? Thus, in the shocking conclusion of the Cell games, Cell is destroyed and peace restored. However, the price of victory was high. Gohan tries to wish his father back to life, but... I think the Earth will be safer without me. So thanks for trying, everyone. But please, don't wish me back. Trunks return to the future. And a new age began. Uh, uh, well, so Gohan is one who ends up. Years have uh, passed I, since I the battle with Cell. Now a student in high school, Gohan also fights crime in Hercule City as Great Saiyaman. Hercule's daughter, Videl, threatens to expose him if he does not enter the World Tournament. Hesitant at first, Gohan changes his mind when he learns that Goku will also enter. Vegeta, Gohan's brother Goten, Trunks, Piccolo, and Krillin all sign up as well. But little... Sorry, I accidentally pressed X. Sorry, everyone. Not it started again. Oh, God damn it. Well, in the Boo saga, if you can tell by the name, is centered around defeating the main antagonist, Boo. The pink one, not the ghost. Boo takes on a few different forms, but unlike with Freezer and Cell, we do get to fight most of them as Goku. But before we deal with Boo, we have to fight Vegeta, who has gone ape shit. We receive the Super Saiyan 2 transformation. Which is my personal favourite transformation, in case anyone was wondering. Nobody we collect the final two Dragon Balls and then go to the mountains and confront Vegeta. And by confront, I mean beat the shit out of him. Vegeta, I'm sensing a massive power. It must be Majin Buu. If we don't stop now, everyone we care about will be destroyed. Bulma, Trunks, everyone. Shut up. I don't care. I sold my soul to Bobbity to be rid of such petty attachments. You're lying. I know you don't really believe that. All right, you win. We'll postpone our fight for now. Yeah, so Vegeta blew himself up in a glorious fashion. Hey, Krillin! Piccolo! Great! You're not statues anymore! You guys had me worried for a second. Next fight is against Fat Boo. So, you're Machin Boo. I guess Vegeta and I underestimated you. We really didn't think you'd be this powerful. Here, why don't I teach you a thing or two about sand? What you're seeing now, this is my normal state. This is a Super Saiyan. And if I push it beyond that, you get Super Saiyan 2. And this is to go even further beyond. I 
call this one Super Saiyan 3. Sorry that took so long. I haven't had much chance to practice this transformation. Do not stick. Big hammers, you big funny. Ah yes, Super Saiyan 3, a transformation so powerful that your eyebrows fall off. Now Fat Boo, for whatever reason, is one of the most aggressive characters to fight. He will be on your ass constantly throughout the fight. The only counter is to be even more aggressive. Thanks, you too. But I don't have time to play with you all day. I've got to go now. And the reward for winning is another character unlock. Goku, it's time for you to return. Oh yeah, hey Piccolo, when I see Gohan over there, I'll tell him you said hello. Oh yeah, Goku is still dead by the way. He was allowed to visit Earth for a day or something, but I guess it wasn't important enough for the game to bring up. But, there you go. You're welcome people who don't know the anime story. Death has almost no meaning in the Dragon Ball universe. In fact, you're probably better off dead, quite frankly. Well, Goku gets sent to the other world and then he's back. This is where Super Boo is introduced, which is one of Boo's multiple transformations. He absorbs other characters and gains their powers. That's why he looks like he's cosplaying as other characters. The next fight will be using a fusion character. Fusion is a mechanic that allows certain characters to fuse together and gain a major power boost. There are two types of fusion in the game. The first fusion is done with a fusion dance. When using this type of fusion, the key gauge is replaced with a timer. Until the timer runs out, you have infinite key. When it reaches zero, the fusion ends. The second type is the Potara's fusion. When using this fusion, you keep the key gauge and remain fused until the end of the fight. Now I'm Super Vegito! Yeah, and... Whoops. I've got you this time. Damn it. Why you? That's cheating. You can't use. Oh, well, I guess I'll just have to absorb you, too. Nothing to worry about. He let himself be absorbed on purpose. He's trying to save the others before he destroys Boo. What? His fusion is worn off. But I thought the effects of the Patara earrings were supposed to be permanent. Who knows what sort of nasty stuff is inside Boo's body? Maybe it dissolved the fusion. Hey, Tekra! Come here! I found Trunks and the others! Great, Vegeta! Now let's tear them out of here and fast! I feel strange. What are they trying to pull? You freed all the fighters I've worked so hard to absorb! This is bad. Who's lost a lot of power? But I still don't think I can beat him. So now we are fighting inside Boo. Now that's level variety for ya. The gimmick to this fight is that your health is constantly ticking down. It doesn't make that much of a difference to the fight, but is something different. up next is the final fight against Kid Boo. Now it is important that you finish the fight using the move Super Spirit Bomb. 
If you don't, the story ends and you'll miss out on some extra content and you'll have to start the story mode all over again just to unlock it. So don't do that. Because cause I, I definitely didn't do that. Mm -mm. Wouldn't have any idea about that. Yay! So the world is saved once again. Using the spirit bomb to defeat Kid Boo unlocks the fight with Oob, Boo's reincarnation. something you know that I mean really strong but you could still be a whole lot stronger how'd you like to train with me once you defeat him he is unlocked and that is the end of Goku's campaign Goku abandons his family to train with U because he's a piece of shit father and a terrible grandfather and he sucks and he's stupid and I hate him boy that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Like mentioned way earlier in the video, collecting all seven Dragon Balls grants you a wish. Well, you can't wish for whatever you want, but you do get to pick one of three options. Breakthrough is a capsule that unlocks all of the character's abilities, including transformations. Memories unlock voice clips, and Mysterious Vest is a rare capsule. Of course, I pick Breakthrough. Now that the first playthrough is complete, we can move on to the second playthrough and start unlocking quite a bit of extra stuff. Plus it is really fun to just completely destroy people with your overpowered character. Oh, poor Raditz. <laughs> he never stood a chance. On the second playthrough during the Freezer Saga, we are able to fight Cooler. It's kind of weird that you can fight Metal Cooler before facing his regular form, but the movies don't really fit in with the timeline anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Just an odd choice, I thought. Fre Freeza! Ah, I thought the distress call was a mistake. Now I see why my brother had to make it. But I assure you, my brother's weakness is not a trait I share. Also, it kicks you out to the world map and makes you re-enter to fight him. Later! <laughs> And now he is metal in a span of 10 seconds. 
Even if I lose, I will be remade even stronger thanks to the power of the Big Getty Star. Why? <laughs> well, that was... Disappointing. No! Impossible! This time, it's finally over. Didn't even unlock anything. If you travel to this location in the Boo Saga, the Broly storyline will begin. Instead of moving on to the Kid Boo fight after winning the two Super Boo fights, an alternative cutscene with Vegeta will play. Broly can be faced after this cutscene. Just like in the anime, he is ridiculously huge. The fight isn't that difficult because Goku is leveled up so much by this point, but Broly manages to reduce my health to half a bar. Because they suck. I mean, I don't know. It's a mystery to me. Winning the battle unlocks Broly, which is something you really want to do. Because he is the only villain, unless you count Vegeta, which I don't, that has a story campaign. Another unlock you can get from defeating Broly is the Gogeta fusion. You'll be able to put it to the test in a match against Gotenks at the World Tournament Arena. It's a awesome prize. We're better at fusion than you. We won't let you win just because you're our dad. Careful, boys. Your old men still have a trick or two up their sleeve. This is an area where the game excels, rewarding the player that goes the extra mile. And it isn't even the last thing you can unlock from Goku's campaign. If you find the Super Saiyan 4 transformation capsule, you can fight and unlock a Mega Shen run from Dragon Ball GT. Out of all the characters, Goku's Dragon Universe campaign is the most comprehensive. So when it comes to the other characters, I'm going to be more brief as they cover most of the same ground, just with a slight variance in the story. Next, let's play as my favourite character, Piccolo. Best Dad. Piccolo is one of the game's best characters. He's powerful, swift and has incredible reach and he only needs two transformations to reach his final form. In Piccolo's version of the Raditz fight you will receive the ability Special Beam Cannon which is the move that was actually used to defeat Raditz in the manga and anime. While Goku is dead, Piccolo ends up training Gohan to help fight against the same threat. After that, not much is different from Goku's campaign. Vegeta and Nappa are defeated and it moves on to the Freezer Saga. On planet Namek, Piccolo will encounter Nell and fuse with him to increase his power. The battle against Freezer's second form takes place here. So that's Freezer. He doesn't look nearly as tough as I thought. This one, there's something different about him. He's not like the other Namics. But he can be defeated all the same. He big. After defeating his second form, Freezer will transform once again. He also big. <laughs> My, my, that was a fine attack, but oops, you used all your energy. Wait, there's a massive power level headed this way. Goku? The Android slash Cell Saga in Piccolo's campaign is a lot more involved than Goku's thanks to the fact that Piccolo wasn't passed out for the majority of it. This time you actually have to fight some androids. The first is Android 20, also known as Dr. Jiro. Once that fight is over, Piccolo will fuse with Kami for yet another power boost. With a newfound strength, the following battle with Cell's first form is very straightforward. In an attempt to stop Sal from absorbing the androids to achieve his perfect form, we must fight Android 17. Before the fight, we got a new technique, Hellzone Grenade. Nowhere for you to run. This is the end. Despite his efforts, Sal does eventually reach his final form, but hey, at least we unlocked Android 17. 
Boo Saga. After wandering around Lost, I finally found what I was looking for. If we drop down into Central City, we will meet up with Fidel. And for that, we unlock Hercule. And that leads into the campaign's final fight against Boo in the hyperbolic time chamber. <laughs> Okay, I bought us a little time. Thanks to Piccolo, the fusion was a success. Gotenks' incredible power was unleashed. As he drove Majin Buu back, the restoration of peace seemed only a step away. Up next is one of the most powerful and talented martial artists on earth. Courageous, faithful, and good-natured, Krillin! Another one of my favorite. Because his fists and kicks have limited range, using Key Blast is essential for playing him. Krillin only has two fights in the Saiyan Saga, one against the Cybermen and the other against Nappa. While on Namek, we will unlock Krillin's only transformation hidden potential from the Guru. Krillin faces two of the Ginyu Force members, Rakum and Captain Ginyu, who has taken over Goku's body. What's wrong, Goku? You look a little strange. And what's with the scouter? <laughs> Do you really want to know? <laughs> 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 Understand it. This body should have much more power than this. Nothing's wrong with the body. It's the driver that stinks. Why don't you just give up? In the saga, Krillin's final two fights are against Frieza in a second <laughs> and final form, <laughs> and then he dies. But don't worry, he gets wished back. Beating Krillin's campaign for the first time unlocks his wife, Android 18. Now during the second playthrough, if we talk with this frog on Namek, we are able to move on to the android slash cell side with Krillin. Why is this the trigger? I don't know. In this saga, there is just one fight, but first we must locate Android 16 and deliver him to Bulma for repair. Once this is done, we are awarded with unlocking Android 16. Nice. Then we can go fight Cell and that is it for Krillin's campaign. This not possible! I am perfect! He spat out 18. I'll save her. Goku, you do the rest. Just wait. I'll ask the dragon to turn you into a normal human. Then I'll wish 17 back to life. That way, you two will be happy together. You idiot! 17 is my twin brother. And if you think you'll win my heart with that lousy wish, guess again. Huh? In the Vegeta. Vegeta is up next. The Saiyans, once a proud warrior race, made a living by conquering planets and selling them. However, most of the Saiyans were wiped out when their own homeworld was destroyed. Only the Prince Vegeta, Nappa, Raditz, and his younger brother Kakarot survived. Now, each of them approaches the Earth, each with a different goal in mind. Vegeta's campaign is a similar length to Goku's, if not longer. Is it longer? Hmm, maybe. It's hard to tell. Vegeta's campaign is quite unique as you start off as playing as the villain. In the Saiyan saga, Vegeta makes use of the Scouter instead of the Focus ability. It works the exact same way, it just uses different visuals. We can also blow up cities for money. 
Nice. The first fight is against Goku and then with his young son Gohan. On Namek, Vegeta spends most of the time tracking down the Dragon Balls to wish for immortality so he can defeat Frieza. For the first time we get to fight Frieza in his first form. You miserable worm! You dare to get in my way! Now you will suffer the consequences! Maybe I will and maybe I won't. By the way, don't expect this to be easy, Frieza. <laughs> <laughs> After Frieza's final form proves too much for Vegeta, we move on to the Android slash Cell Saga. Vegeta has now gained Super Saiyan status and we're up against Android 17 and Android 18 for the first time. You know what? Just for that, I'm not gonna take it easy on you. absorbed we will face semi-perfect cell and then perfect cell with the cell saga complete is on to the final stage now Vegeta's boo saga plays out almost exactly the same as Goku's apart from at the start at the start of the saga we get to play as Margin Vegeta he is even in this form in the overworld which is pretty cool you unlock his son Trunks after completing the campaign for the first time. During the second playthrough we can also face Cooler on Namek, fight against the legendary Super Saiyan Broly and do the fusion battle against Gotenks. Pretty similar to Goku's campaign but a decent alternative if you prefer the same prince. Gohan's Dragon Universe is actually split up into three separate campaigns. Kid Gohan, Teen Gohan and Adult Gohan. As Kid Gohan you are very limited with abilities. So limited in fact that I ended up buying some from the capsule store. One of the more notable events in Gohan's story doesn't occur until the Cell Saga where he achieves Super Saiyan 2 and we can perform the iconic father and son Kamehameha. On a side note there is a sparring match in the hyperbolic time chamber between Goku and Gohan which does not occur in Goku's campaign. This is one of those strange aspects of the way the narrative is told in this game. In many cases as we play through a character's journey we end up fighting a lot of the same fights usually from the perspective of the other character as seen in many of the fights between Goku and Vegeta. However there are times when a fight is completely absent from a character's campaign even though they were clearly there. Basically what I'm saying is, is that the game is very inconsistent when it comes to the storytelling. By the time of the Boo Saga, Gohan has grown into adult. For the first fight, it's a sparring match against his little brother Goten. Hey Goten, how about some sparring with your big brother? You know what sparring is? Yeah, mom showed me all about it while you were studying. Come on now! <laughs> You are so strong, I didn't stand a chance. You're incredible too, Goten. I had no idea you were quite this good. If you keep on training hard, you might be able to enter the world tournament too. After this match, you unlock Goten and can continue on to face Fidel. Come on then, Gohan. Let's fight. Uh, now just hold on. <laughs> After a very abrupt transition, we are going to be fighting the King of Demons, definitely not Satan, it is Deborah. You foolish boy, keep playing this game and you're going to get hurt. After being defeated by Boo for the first time, the Outer Supreme Kai unlocks Gohan's hidden potential to use in the final fight against Super Boo. And for our troubles, we unlock. I am the unmitigated champion of justice who tolerates no evil. <laughs> Great Saiyan at your service. 
I'd say those two hours of practice last night just paid off. I'm going to be going over Tien and Yamcha's story modes at the same time because they're not very long and they don't have that much to go over. Frankly, I'm just happy to be included. Mr. Popo gives Tien and Yamcha a free level up, exactly how Goku did with Nail. Your little monster wasn't as strong as you thought, huh? <laughs> I'd say your celebration is still a bit premature. <laughs> Yamcha is the first to encounter Android 20 in the Cell Saga, while Tien battles Semi Perfect Cell as well as Cell Jr. Tien also has to deal with Super Buu after he absorbs Gotenks. Yamcha's story concludes with a match between himself and Tien at the World Martial Arts Championship. In terms of the timeline, Oob's story actually takes place after the Boo saga. Nothing much of note really happens in it, if I'm being perfectly honest. It's just Oob meeting Goku at the World Martial Arts Tournament and then training for a bit with Fat Boo before fighting against Goku once again. And that's it. Now because Oob is the last Dragon Universe campaign we needed to complete, we receive an invitation to fight in the Dragon Arena. So let's head on over there now, shall we? Okay, I kid, I kid. We'll do Broly. Long ago, the evil Bibbidi somehow created the monster Majin Buu. Unable to control Buu, Bibbidi sealed him away and carried him to Earth. Thus, when Bibbidi was defeated by the Supreme Kai, Buu was thought to be neutralized. However, Bibbidi had a son, a son with the same evil heart, Babidi. After bringing the Demon King Dabura under his control, Babidi hatched his plans to revive Buu. The Supreme Kai has turned to Goku and his friends for help. Can they stop Babidi in time? Now Broly's story mode is pure fair prepare. <laughs> now Broly's story mode is pure fan service. He is the only villain to have his own Dragon Universe campaign in the entire game. Taking place in the Boo Saga, we get to fly around the world as the legendary Super Saiyan in search of our mortal enemy, Goku, who Broly hates with a passion because he cried too much as a baby. I, I'm not making this up, that's actually his character motivation. While searching, we end up fighting some little boys, then a little girl, and even a little man, before we get stopped by an adult. The moral of the story is, if you beat up little kids, don't get caught. And that is a lesson I believe all of us could benefit from learning. <laughs> Welcome to the secret arena of the infamous Red Ribbon Army, and the last place you'll ever see. Who will fight? After completing Dragon Universe with each character, you can fight in the Dragon Arena. The Dragon Arena is a game mode that allows you to fight multiple opponents using a level based custom character. You can unlock rare capsules and earn XP in this mode. Now you may have noticed this password screen that kept popping up while I was playing. Well this is where you actually use it. It was a kind of online system where you could share your password with other people and they could fight your leveled up character. I never used this as a kid because I didn't actually know that this is what the passwords were for. I honestly thought that they were a kind of save system for people who didn't have a memory card like they used to have in uh, really old games. Next let's take a look at the world tournament mode. It's a tournament setting as the name suggests where you battle for money and prizes. There are four different tournaments to choose from each with its own prize money, battle count and rules. The world tournament mode also allows you to compete against up to eight players in a martial arts tournament. You cannot earn any prize money if more than one human player is present. There is novice which is available from the start. It consists of three battles played in a ring so there is a potential for ring out. Adept can be unlocked after beating the novice tournament at least once and then purchasing the capsule from the store. There are four battles that also take place in the ring. The advanced is unlocked the same way but you must beat the adept tournament at least once. 
You fight five battles in the ring. The final tournament is the Sal Games. This tournament is a bit different as it doesn't have any ring out. The only way to win is to deplete all five of your opponent's health bars to zero. As for unlocking this one, first you will have to unlock the Dragon Arena mode, which as stated before can be done by finishing the Dragon Universe mode for all its characters. Play it and have Sal break into a battle, which is a random event that will happen sometimes and you must defeat him. I'm not that into this mode, mostly due to the ring out system. Sometimes you'll be winning and your opponent gets a lucky hit and it's all over. However, it is a good way to earn money to buy capsules from the store. Let's head over there now. The capsule store is pretty self-explanatory. It's a store where you can go to spend the money you earn from playing Dragon Universe and the World Tournament modes. There are four different types of capsules. Ability capsules, equipment capsules, item capsules and system capsules. The store is randomised so it does pay to check in often to see what they have. In dueling mode, this is where I would face off against my friend. If I had one. You can either compete against the computer opponent or against another player. In addition, you can also watch a fight between two computer fighters. Why you'd want to do this? I don't know, but you can. So there you go. Even after all this time, this game holds a special place in my heart. As a kid, Budokai 3 had everything I could ever ask for as a huge Dragon Ball Z fan. A fun story mode where I could fly around as some of my favourite heroes, a huge roster of characters to play and unlock, simple but engaging gameplay, timeless cell shaded graphics and a killer soundtrack. Budokai 3 has the highest review score out of all three Budokai games, but unfortunately it had the lowest sales. Maybe people were burnt out by the Dragon Ball Z franchise, or put off by some other game. <coughs> Budokai 2. Whatever it was, the franchise moved on to the Budokai Tenkaichi series, which I also played as a kid. But no other Dragon Ball Z game had captured my affection quite like Budokai 3. Not before, and not since. So do I think Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3 is still good? Despite some storytelling mishaps and being somewhat repetitive, even now I happily played through all of the characters story modes, tried my hand at winning the world tournament, and just had fun messing around in practice mode. I don't think this game is just good. I think this game is pretty good. It is no secret that I adore the Budokai series, as evidenced by the two hours I spent talking about it. And while this may irritate some people, I think that the Budokai games are superior to the Tenkaichi series. Oh shut up! Silly woman! Even though I am a big fan of these games, I haven't played all of them. Missing out on the portable entries, I did have a PlayStation Portable but I had no idea this game existed until recently, so had I been deprived of the greatest Budokai game of all time? No. Stop it! You're spoiling it! You're spoiling everything! Dragon Ball Z Shin Budokai was released in 2006 for the PSP. It was developed by Dimps, the same company that was responsible for Budokai 1, 2 and 3. It borrows heavily from the previous entries in the series. At first glance, it appears to be a portable adaptation of Budokai 3's gameplay. Shin Budokai, on the other hand, modifies the gameplay in a few key ways which helps it to differentiate it from the games that came before it. My first thoughts when entering a match was that this game looks great. The benefit of the cell shading style really shines through as it can look fantastic even on a less powerful system. The characters stand out from the backgrounds thanks to the vibrant colours and outlines, with the backgrounds themselves looking quite good. Although the snow effect isn't particularly impressive because the snow is simply placed over the camera rather than falling within the stages. Also sometimes the parallax is off and gives the impression that the background is moving. While the game was able to keep the character models in high quality, 
The characters no longer have any mouth movements. You are pretty good! Or expressions, other than one neutral face. Although I must admit that the faces look better than those in Budokai 3. It's just a shame they don't move. The animations are wonderful, and they contribute to the controls feeling extremely satisfying to use. Shin Budokai's characters move faster than those in previous Budokai games. Combos are delivered faster, and the characters themselves can move faster. Several new movement animations have been added to smooth out the action, including a small backwards flip when someone recovers from being knocked down, which they also do in the air. Somehow, it's magic. Wow, well, I guess it's key. It's key magic. Don't worry, it's kin. The key blasts and auras still look great. The special and ultimate attacks have been toned down a bit, but this ties into the gameplay. Shin Budokai's soundtrack is just the Budokai 3 soundtrack, which if you're like me and love the Budokai 3 soundtrack, then this is a plus. But I can't help but feel that they're reusing these tracks a little bit too much. Ah! As a lot of Budokai 3's soundtrack was also featured in the first Budokai Tenkaichi game, at least for the versions released outside of Japan anyway. All of the sound effects from the anime are carried over, as are the Funimation dub voices. Given that this is made for a portable system, I'm honestly really impressed. It looks great, it sounds great, but does it play great? Shin Budokai's gameplay is very similar to Budokai 3, but it has a few differences that set it apart from its older brother. It has standard punches and kicks, as well as the key blast. When you press the guard button at the right time, you can not only guard but also dodge attacks. Key moves can be charged and the longer they are charged, the more damage they deal. Shin Budokai saw the first application of the Aura Burst system. Holding the R button causes the character to emit a burst of energy around them. During this burst, the character has the ability of dashing around the arena at a breakneck speed, dash punching the opponent or hitting the opponent with an attack that stuns them for several seconds. Not only is the character vulnerable to attack while using Aura Burst, but the burst also depletes the key gauge, and if the key gauge reaches zero, the character loses their transformation and is stunned for a few seconds. Aura Burst was later seen in Infinite World and Burst Limit, but I found it to be the most fun in this game. The removal of the capsule system is the most significant gameplay difference between Shin Budokai and Budokai 3. The capsule system has been a fixture of the Budokai series, and it has even been reintroduced for Infinite World. You can customize a character's attacks and passive buffs by equipping up to 7 capsules. Rather than relying on capsules, the characters in Shin Budokai have their own set of moves, including two special moves, an ultimate move, and various combos. A series of punches and kicks will result in a combo that can be cancelled out of, even into special moves. This gives the characters a very versatile and fluid feel to them, even better than in Budokai 3. But not as good as Infinite World. But Infinite World is a whole other can of worms. Oh, shut up! Silly woman! The special and ultimate moves vary depending on your character's form. As a result, you'll occasionally need to change your playstyle mid battle. Another significant change is the health system. Instead of losing a small amount of health when blocking, a character doesn't immediately lose health while blocking attacks. However, the damage dealt while blocking is indicated in red, and if the character can avoid damage for a few seconds, the damage dealt while blocking will heal itself back up. So you can now defend against an ultimate attack while still having a chance to recover with your health intact. Ultimate moves in this game aren't as dynamic and are a lot easier to execute. I believe this is one of the reasons why they changed how the health worked. Ultimates can essentially be performed whenever you have enough key. You don't need to go into hyper mode or anything. This means that using these attacks is less risky and I find myself using them more frequently. They aren't really overpowered as the AI has the habit of doing the same. Since the cutscenes that used to accompany these attacks have been significantly toned down, they aren't as annoying when spammed and can now be blocked or avoided with careful timing. Similar to the Tenkaichi series, characters can start a fight already transformed and any character with multiple transformations can only select one to become in a fight. All transformations, whether Super Saiyan, Super Saiyan 2 or 3, can be activated at 4 bars of key, just one bar higher than the starting level. Fighters can reach their strongest transformations far too easily, 
putting characters with weaker transformations at a disadvantage. Furthermore, because stronger transformations cost the same as weaker transformations, there is no reason to ever choose weaker transformations, except for the fact that Super Saiyan 2 looks the coolest. If the game simply required more key for more powerful transformations, I think this system would have worked much better and be more balanced. The game features a total of 18 characters, 13 of which are unlocked from the start. This roster is quite a bit smaller than the other Budokai games, and when combined with the removal of the capsule system customization, it is very limited when compared to its console counterparts. The characters that are present on the other hand are well realized with the iconic attacks and move sets. The real time ultimate attacks and the aura bursts allow for faster paced fights. With the removal of Dragon Rush and less flashy attack animations, it feels like you are being interrupted less during a fight. It just feels more fluid and I really like it. To the point where this might be my favourite Budokai game purely based on the gameplay. However, there are still the game modes to go over, and this is where Shin Budokai starts to fall a bit short. Dragon Road is the story mode for Shin Budokai. The structure of Dragon Road is very simple. You enter a map that is curiously laid out on Snake Way. I am not sure why the mode isn't called Snake Way or Snake Road or something, but a lot of the plot revolves around the other world, so this imagery does make sense. I just feel like they missed an opportunity for the, the name to match up better with that, doesn't matter. There will be an icon with a profile picture of a character you'll be fighting against. Each of these icons will take you to a cutscene in which the characters interact with one another. And I use the term cutscene very loosely. Because if you've ever played Budokai 3 or a visual novel game, you'll be familiar with this type of cutscene. The characters will communicate with one another via text box with an image of the character. The character artwork is fine, I guess. Nothing special, and appears to be just renderings of the 3D models. The main problem with these character images is that each character and their various transformations only have one meaning each character has only one expression, usually slightly angry but ultimately indifferent, regardless of what happens. Ah, we're gonna die! Meh. Shin Budokai takes place two years after Kid Buu's defeat. This is a refreshing change of pace from the other Budokai games, who have all followed the Saiyan saga up to the Buu saga. The story mode follows the plot of the Fusion Reborn movie, but not exactly, as it does deviate quite a bit from the plot of the movie by adding in lots of... well, we'll get to that. Goku is going camping with his friends and hopes to be joined by Piccolo and Vegeta. Goku expecting Vegeta to go camping with him is a bit optimistic in my view, but that's the plot. <laughs> Goku is taken aback when he sees his son Gohan, who is supposed to be studying for a test. Gohan explains that his mother told him, You can't stay in your room all the time! So he decides to get some exercise today. This is the setup for the game's first fight. Each icon on the map menu will take you to a different fight, and there is always a short story cutscene before each fight. This structure works extremely well for the game's portability. You get a little bit of both story and gameplay. These bite-sized segments allow you to pick up and play, as well as put down the game when necessary. Goku wins the sparring match since Gohan hasn't fought in a long time and is out of shape. Goku and Gohan take off flying to the camping location. Some rather mundane events occur, such as them catching fish and shit like that. And honestly, this opening segment is a whole lot of not much happening. And a lot of the game is like that, <laughs> with the story at least. The game is merely trying to set up easier fights for you to participate in, so that you can learn how to use the game's controls. There is no tutorial in this game, only a training mode which is fine if you've played any of the previous Budokai titles, because the gameplay is very similar. However, if this is your first time playing a Budokai game, the story mode starts off quite easy. There is a fight between Goku and Krillin, for example. We control Goku, who is much stronger and has more health, so you have a huge advantage over the AI which allows you to experiment a bit. As the story progresses, the game does the opposite, with the odds being placed very much against the player. The enemies you face will have a lot more health and will spam their ultimate moves. This gives the game a very inconsistent difficulty curve, with one fight feeling like you win by the skin of your teeth, with the next being a cakewalk, which as a pure game design standpoint is not good. As ideally you'd want the difficulty curve to be fairly smooth, however in the terms of a Dragon Ball Z game, 
I actually think this works really well. It lets the characters that are meant to be more powerful than others actually get to be more powerful in gameplay. And overall the difficulty isn't actually very high, so it never really gets frustrating. After each battle, you'll be given a rating. Your battle rank is judged on three things, time, tech and life. The faster you defeat your opponent, the higher your time ranking. Tech, I'm not really sure about. I'm guessing it's based on the moves you use. Life is an obvious one. The more life you have at the end, the higher the ranking for this category. Now depending on how you score in the categories, you can get one of these ranks. Z, S, A, B, C, D. Depending on how well you perform during a fight, you'll be rewarded with Z. Like I mentioned before, there is no capsule system or anything like that, so it's not like you need the Z to buy capsules. So what exactly do you spend the Z on? Well, I'm going to go over that a little bit later on the video, but let's just say it rhymes with the word disappointing. Dragon Road consists of five chapters, even though the menu makes it look like there will be much more. Why is there so much extra space? It tricked me into thinking there will be more, but there isn't. Anyway, while Goku and his friends are out camping, a portal between Hell and Earth opens up and the dead are being resurrected. Boy, that escalated quickly including two of the series' most notorious villains, Frieza and Cell. Yes, it wouldn't be a Budokai game without multiple fights against Cell and Frieza. Okay, it's no way near as repetitive as Budokai 2. This is mainly due to how often you'll be switching between characters, as this story mode isn't just played from one character's perspective. You get to play as almost all of the available characters at some point in the campaign, even the villains. This not only keeps the game from being less repetitive, but also allows for a more elaborate story since we aren't just stuck with following one character. During certain points in Dragon Road, there are branching paths that you can go down. To access these different story scenarios, you just need to pick a dialogue option that shows up during certain cutscenes. So these alternate routes aren't accessed through the core gameplay, which is a bit unfortunate as this was sort of a thing in Budokai 3 where performing a certain way in a fight would change how the story played out. For example, you could unlock Oob by defeating Kid Boo with the spirit bomb. But yeah, these choices will change the fights that you participate in and you will need to go down all the paths to unlock all of the characters. The impact that these paths have in the overall story is pretty negligible as they don't really change the story in any meaningful way. It always plays out with Goku and Vegeta fusing into either Gogeta or Vegito to defeat the demon Janimba. You do get to pick which one to fuse into, which is pretty cool. By the way, Vegito is the right choice. His moveset works way better against Janimba. And this is coming from one who likes Gogeta better, in his base form, which isn't even in this game. Zero out of ten. So the main plot is... fine? It's based off the Fusion Reborn movie and has enough setup to make the main conflict not feel out of nowhere. Now the storytelling on the other hand is quite bad. As in a lot of it reads like a bad fan fiction. The characters just aren't written that well and feel a bit out of character. The best example takes place at the beginning of chapter 4. Janimba has the ability to alter reality and begins interfering with multiple dimensions and timelines in an attempt to throw the universe into chaos. Future Trunks ends up coming across Android 18 and the interaction goes like this. Wait, calm down. You're that Trunks, right? Huh? You're the number 18 from the past? Exactly. So this is the future of that world. Looks that way. Oh, I see. So here you're not doing anything bad? Right now, I'm just a housewife. Housewife? Well, anyway, what, what happened? What's going on with this world? Huh? Did something happen? Uh, well, man, this is annoying. Okay, so I'm only going to say this once. Uh? Okay, I'm... I'm married to Krillin. What? We have a daughter. What? Her name's Marin. She takes after Krillin. She's really cute. Wait, how does an android have a daughter? You see what I mean about the writing coming across very fan fictiony? It's a shame that the writing is so bad because I really like the idea of the story. 
I just don't like the execution of it. The idea of having branching paths is really cool, but they don't really amount to anything. I really like the variety of characters that you get to play with while going through this story, but the actual character interactions aren't very engaging. Shin Budokai Story Mode is really let down by its story, because the gameplay is fantastic. With better writing, this really could have been something special. Unfortunately, it falls short. There are a few other modes to play besides Dragon Road. Arcade mode is strange. Not because the gameplay is strange, as you essentially just participate in a bunch of fights, but rather the goal is strange. In arcade mode, you try to collect the Dragon Balls, which makes sense given that this is a Dragon Ball game. But, and this is a big but, even if you collect all seven, you will not be granted a wish. The character is granted a wish, but you as the player are not. It's strange because in previous Budokai games, you could choose from a few rewards, such as money or capsules. Oh yeah. So the shop in this game is terrible. Because there is no capsule system, they had to come up with something for you to spend your money on. And they came up with stickers that you can use to personalise your profile card. Disappointing. So to sum it up, the Dragon Balls don't grant you a wish because there is nothing worth wishing for. Profile cards are used as an ID in network battles. I haven't participated in any network battles, but apparently that's what the power level is for. Every network battle you win raises your power level, and having a higher power level means something, and I don't know. <laughs> in Z Trial Mode, there are two different modes you can play, Time Attack and Survival. There are seven courses in Time Attack where you must defeat various enemies as quickly as possible. Survival Mode requires you to defeat as many opponents as possible in a row. It's a non-stop gauntlet and your health does not fully regenerate between fights. I don't really like the time pressure of the time attack mode, so I only played it once. Survival mode on the other hand is a lot of fun and adds a nice extra challenge. The training mode is essentially a carbon copy of Budokai 3. There are a lot of options you can fiddle around with, making it a great mode to practice and experiment with characters. Just a really solid training mode as usual. The one glaring omission has to be the absence of a traditional versus mode in which you can set up a custom match against the computer. I'm not sure why this was left out because it seems like the most obvious mode to include. The various modes are nothing special. They all use the excellent core mechanics so I couldn't say that any of them are bad. Dragon Road is by far the most substantial, though even with doing all of the branching pathways, it still isn't all that long. Plus the small amount of characters to unlock doesn't give much reason for repeat playthroughs. Dragon Ball Z Shin Budokai's gameplay is fantastic and is probably my favourite in the series. It plays a bit faster than Budokai 3, but without the annoying fatigue system found in Infinite World and also without the soul crushing AI. Unfortunately, this game is let down by its story mode. It had a lot of potential to provide something truly unique, but in the end, it just couldn't live up to that potential. But maybe the sequel did. Dragon Ball Z Shin Budokai excelled at its gameplay, but I found its story mode to be lacking. Many individuals may think that a story mode in a fighting game isn't all that important, but I'm one of those people that plays Dragon Ball Z games for the story and the fan service. Nice. Shin Budokai 2 shares many mechanics and features with its predecessor and feels more like an expansion than a sequel. So because of this, I'm going to be skipping over the stuff that I already talked about in the Shin Budokai 1 video. So go watch the video on the first game if you care enough to do so. But if you don't care, then let's move on, shall we? Dragon Ball Z Shin Budokai 2, also known as Dragon Ball Z Shin Budokai Another Road, is a fighting game that was released for the PlayStation Portable in 2007. It is the sequel to the 2006 game Dragon Ball Z Shin Budokai. What an amazing fact. And is the second Dragon Ball Z game to be released for the PSP.
Another road is the name of the story mode, which is a fucking weird coincidence. The plot of this game is a brand new story, rather than a retelling of any of the sagas or movies. Kind of. Allegedly. <laughs> this helps to distinguish this game from the other Budokai titles, because even Shin Budokai 1 followed the Fusion Reborn movie, though it did deviate slightly, with a lot of meandering. An alternate timeline saw Goku suffer and die from a heart condition, and Earth's mightiest defenders eventually succumb to the androids. Despair rules the bleak world. The last surviving warrior of this world, known only as Trunks, travelled back in time to meet Goku. Over the course of successive fights with the androids and Cell, he grew stronger. And now, harmony in the past and future has been re-established. After some time has passed and the major cities have been rebuilt, the World Martial Arts Tournament is held once again. Trunks has decided to participate in the tournament, and while there he meets both Kabito and Shin, aka the Supreme Kai. I know, it's a twist. Kabito requests that Trunks transform into a Super Saiyan, which he does, <laughs> attracting the wizard Bobbity and his henchman Deborah to the tournament grounds. There you are. Hmm. What's this? He seems to have an impressive energy. Deborah begins stealing energy from the tournament fighters in order to resurrect Majin Buu. Is this beginning to sound familiar? Recognizing this, Trunks tries to stop him, but is unable to move due to the Supreme Kai's powers, who does not want Trunks to fight them just yet. They try to flee, but Deborah starts destroying cities to lure them out. When Trunks notices this, he breaks free only to have Deborah drain his energy. Babidi and Deborah are awestruck by his immense power and wonder if there are others like him. Babidi examines Trunks' memories and discovers the Z Fighters from the main timeline. Okay, so to avoid confusion, I'm going to be referring to the the timeline from like the anime and manga as the main timeline and the future timeline as the future timeline. Hello. Yuck, what the fuck? After the prologue, we are teleported back in time 10 years to 1997 with these janky looking models. Yes, this is a handheld game, but the transition from the beautiful graphics of the fights to this is so jarring. So in the story mode, you'll be taken to a section of the world map where you can fly around, similar to the dragon universe mode in Budokai 3 completely different. You'll be given a clear condition that is usually to defeat an enemy and sometimes within a time limit which you need to achieve in order to clear the stage. You're also given an optional mission that if completed will reward you with a Z ranking for the stage. The higher your rank the more Zenny you will earn. You will spawn on a small portion of the world map most likely because loading the entire thing would be too taxing on the PSP. You can change the camera view from close to not as close to even more not as close. Your default fly speed is extremely slow, making the controls feel sluggish. You can accelerate by holding down the X button, which feels better. Not like, <laughs> but more like, also it lasts for bugger all time. It just makes flying around the map not all that fun. To engage in combat, simply fly into the enemy, who will also be flying around the map. But fighting the enemies isn't the only thing you'll have to worry about because they'll be trying to destroy cities as they fly around. The health percentage of a city is displayed in the upper left corner of the screen. If an enemy begins to destroy cities, its percentage will decrease. You must defeat the enemy and position yourself close to the city in order to restore it. Not only will the city's percentage return, but you will also regain any lost health. The system is honestly just kind of annoying. But I'm gonna go over it in more detail later on because the annoyingness just gets more annoying as the game progresses. It's such a terrible sentence. <laughs> Our first objective is to defeat Deborah within the time limit. So all we have to do now is to fly into him. And my first thought when entering this fight was, what the fuck? So the camera angle in this game is similar to that scene in the Tenkaichi series. However, you can move freely within the 3D space in those games, and your movement was orientated around your opponent. However, in Shin Budokai 2, your movement is restricted and the controls do not accommodate this camera angle. So when you press up on the directional buttons, which you'd think would move your character towards your opponent, it doesn't. Instead, you are supposed to press right. It just doesn't feel right. Furthermore, it is difficult to read your opponent's movements clearly. Fortunately, you can return the camera to the side on view, as it should be. Now, I have no problem with the game allowing you to change the camera angle if that's how you want to play the game, because you're some kind of psychopath. My problem is that this is the camera's default setting, 
Why would you make this camera the default when the controls of the game are clearly not designed for it? If this was someone's first Budokai game, you might think that this is how it's supposed to be. The cool fighting mechanics are pretty much copy pasted from Shin Budokai 1. Not that that's a bad thing as they are excellent. Although there are a few added features that make this gameplay a little differently. We now have a guard bar, so instead of infinite blocking, you only have a few hits before you have to use another form of defense, such as the aura guard. The aura guard uses key, but is much more difficult to break, and can even block ultimate attacks. Unfortunately, the AI has a habit of spamming this move, which can be quite irritating. Throws, fully charged slam attacks, and aura slams can all break through aura guard. A character's aura burst charge is activated by pressing both shoulder buttons at the same time, which has varying effects depending on the character. Some characters receive massive stat boosts, allowing them to deal more damage, while others regenerate health and have their key costs significantly reduced. In the pause menu, you can check a character's power up at the bottom of the command list. When a character transforms, their aura burst charge can change, just like their special and ultimate attacks. However, the weaker aura burst charge is more common in stronger transformations. Aura burst charge is a useful ability that can temporarily increase a character's power, allowing them to turn the tide of the battle in their favour. However, it should be used wisely as it can only be used once per fight, unless you're a Goku, because he is the main character. Well, I guess technically Trunks is the main character in this game, so I have no idea. Unfortunately, Shin Budokai 2 does a bad job at explaining these new mechanics, and by bad, I mean it doesn't explain them at all. There is still no tutorial, which I thought was fine for the first game because it was simpler. Additionally, fighting games tend to rely on players learning through trial and error, as there are many different characters and abilities to experiment with and master. This means that a tutorial mode may not be required to teach players how to play the game effectively. However, these new features aren't very intuitive to figure out, and I hardly even used them when I started because I didn't know what they were and I didn't know how to use them. Deborah flees the battle and fires a massive energy blast into a densely populated city. Trunks is able to withstand the blast and protect the city. He lost consciousness as a result of the damage he'd already sustained. Babidi and Deborah escape, but Trunks overhears their plan to travel to the main timeline and absorb the Z Fighter's energy in order to resurrect Boo. That brings the first chapter to a close. Or does it? If we return to chapter 1 and fail to defeat Devora within the time limit, an alternate path will be revealed. Trunks is severely injured and nearly killed by a powerful key blast from Devora. Kabito sacrifices himself to deflect the attack. Trunks had to seek medical attention because Kabito was their only source of healing. Babidi and Devora were able to gather enough energy to resurrect Boo because they had no one to oppose them. You'll now be fighting Trunks as Majin Boo. This fight is heavily skewed in your favour due to your superior health. With the death of Trunks, the fate of the world was sealed. Boo destroyed the world, then the universe, before turning his attention to the Kais. Those who could have stopped Boo were long gone. The world will soon return to nothingness. That was bloody bleak. Well, on to chapter 2. After being wounded by Deborah while protecting a city from one of his key blasts, Trunks realises that he cannot do it alone. He decides to travel back in time once more to seek assistance from the main timeline's Z fighters. Deborah is attacking West City, and Trunks must defend it if the time machine is to be saved. There are two possible outcomes in this section. Trunks either goes to Corrin's Tower on his way to West City, or directly to the city. He'll get Sensu beans either way. These act as lives. When you lose a fight, you will consume a sensu bean, and using all of them means the game is over. The enemies may also have sensu beans, and you will have to fight them multiple times before they leave the field. When you refight an enemy, they will start with less and less health, so the fights will get quicker. However, it can become quite repetitive, especially if you go out of your way to defeat everyone on the field. Yes, yeah, so Android 18, Cell, and Frieza are here now. But they are not the real ones, rather puppets created by Barbity. You can just avoid fighting them if you can't be bothered. Sometimes they will chase you though. For this stage, you must defeat Deborah once more, but this time before West City is destroyed. If successful, the Time Machine and Trunks' mother Bomber will be saved. Trunks will travel back in time to recruit the help of the Z Fighters. If you fail to protect the city in time, the game will take a different turn. Trunks decides to bring future Gohan and Pycon back to life one day on Earth, 
to aid in the fight, like what Goku was able to do during the Boo Saga. And it is at this point where you will realise how difficult this game can be. It will set strict time limits for you to defeat the enemies, who now have significantly more health. And the time limits aren't just for fights. The timer is also counting down while flying around the map, so you don't have much time to rest between fights. It's an absolute clusterfuck. And I would be extremely impressed by anyone who would be able to do this mission on their first playthrough. If you do manage to win a fight, the enemy will probably call for allies, making it even more of a clusterfuck. Gohan and Paikon will now join you on the field and fight alongside you. At the bottom of the screen is a battle meter. It will display the progress of an ally's fight, whether they are winning or losing, which at this point in the game they are almost certainly going to lose. You can interrupt their fight to try and help them, or you can heal them with one of your sensu beans, but this means less for you. If you fail this mission, which let's be honest you probably will, Trunks must fight alone after Gohan and Paikon's single down earth expires. By himself he cannot stand up to the enemy and is destroyed. With Trunks gone, there is no one left to oppose Babidi's ambitions and the world is doomed. Shit. So we've established that this game can be extremely difficult. However, this is a game that will entice you to return for multiple playthroughs. In Shin Budokai 1, there was no way to customize your character. In Shin Budokai 2, there is the booster system. After a fight, you will be able to select a booster card. Because they are turned down, the outcome is somewhat random. You don't have access to very powerful boosters at the start of the game, but as you progress through it, you will be rewarded with much more powerful ones. You can customise the booster grid with each character. The grid has a maximum of 9 slots. Not all of the slots will be unlocked from the beginning, and you can purchase these slots with Zenny, along with other boosters. Boosters are classified into 3 types. The normal boosters improve various stats such as health, key, strength and a few others. Power-up boosters augment the effects of the other boosters. They have arrows on them so you need to pay attention how you arrange them on your grid. Last but not least there are the extremely rare ultimate boosters. These increase the power of your ultimate move, but because they are so powerful you can only set one of these at a time. Boosters can make a significant difference in the outcome of a battle. And I'm pretty sure the difficulty of the story mode takes these into account. Because the AI isn't necessarily difficult in terms of skill, it's just that their stats are so much higher than yours at the start, and there simply isn't enough time to defeat them without boosted stats. Overall boosters can be a useful tool for those looking to give their characters an advantage in battle. However, keep in mind that these boosters are not a replacement for skill and strategy, and you must still use your wits and fighting abilities to win battles. Boosters are a great reward for fighting and make achieving higher ranks more meaningful because there's something worth spending your ZD on this time around. When you do eventually clear this mission, Boo's resurrection is prevented and that's the end. Not worth it. But what I really like about these branching paths is that the story is changed by the player's actions, and they have a significant impact on the story. I like the first game where you simply chose a dialogue option and it had little impact on the plot. Trunks used his time machine to travel back in time. He explains the situation in the future to Goku and the other Z fighters. Then they all travel to the future. This entire scenario happens within a few text boxes. <laughs> when telling its story, this game, like the first Shin Budokai, employs a visual novel style. The character portraits look much better this time around because the game uses 2D images rather than renders of the 3D models. However, the problem of the characters only having one expression remains. The map section now have character interactions as well. They are typically used to keep you up to date on what the other characters are up to, as well as to provide brief explanations from King Kai. However, these minor interactions can become quite irritating, especially if your allies keep taking out the puppets. Man, I was holding back. You'll be constantly interrupted while attempting to complete the objective, and it gets worse and worse as the game progresses, due to the increasing number of enemies on the field. While it is nice that they added in a little bit more character interactions in the story presentation, overall they are fucking annoying. The graphics in Shin Budokai 2 are nearly identical to those in the first game. The character models are detailed and closely resemble the Dragon Ball Z anime and manga counterparts. The game has smooth animations, fluid movements and a wide range of special effects for various attacks and abilities. The game's environments are also well designed. 
with a variety of different stages to fight on, each with their own distinct look and feel. Overall, the graphics in Shin Budokai 2 are solid and do an excellent job of bringing the Dragon Ball Z universe to life on the PSP. While not as detailed or polished as those found in more recent games, they are still impressive given the PSP's hardware limitations. The music is mostly reused from the Budokai games, which has become a reoccurring theme of these videos, although there are some other tracks, but you'll be going through menus and be like, it's that song again, it's that song again, the song, the same song, it's, it's that one again. The music is excellent, but is becoming very overused at this point. There are two paths you can take in this chapter, but they both lead to the same conclusion, so it doesn't really matter which one you take. The plot differs only slightly, with the bottom path involving you defeating puppet clones... things. And the top path involving Piccolo being taken over by Barbadi. What's so amusing about this is that Vegeta has the audacity to chastise Piccolo for it. Talk about the pot calling the pet- <laughs> Talk about the pot calling the kettle... Mr. Kettle. Talk about calling the pot calling the kettle... Poop <laughs> And then he transforms back into Margin Vegeta. Because of course he does. With all the fighting, Barbadi manages to gather enough energy to resurrect Boo. So Trunks brought the Z fighters to the future to stop Boo's resurrection. But the only reason Boo could be resurrected was because the Z fighters came to the future. Shit. What I don't understand is if Barbadi has enough power to create copies of the Z fighters, then why couldn't he just take the energy from them? Or better yet, just use his own... Yeah, no, fuck it. You must fight and defeat Vegeta while controlling Boo. Following the fight, Babidi orders Boo to kill Vegeta, but he refuses. Babidi then learns from Piccolo's memories that he was murdered by Boo in the main timeline. He also recalls Dragon Balls on Planet Namek from Piccolo's memories, so he travels to Planet Namek in search of the Namekian Dragon Balls. I shit you not, this is actually what happens. Within like two dialogue boxes, we're all... He's gone. Okay. <laughs> I hate the mind reading plot device. It's just so poorly executed and it feels like an ass ball most of the time. Plus, if you take the bottom path, Barbadi never takes over Piccolo, so how would he know? Ah, fuck it. Trunks and the others travel to New Namek in order to find the Namekian Dragon Balls before Barbadi and Kula. Who is also here looking for the Dragon Balls because he is evil? Are we the baddies? Honestly, at this point, the game is just adding enemies and the story doesn't do a good job of justifying their appearance. But it does add variety. But actually, it doesn't at all because you have to fight Metal Caller over and over again. I'd like to apologize to Budokai 2 for complaining about how repetitive it was because, in comparison, it wasn't. I didn't know, okay. I didn't know. During these next few stages, you have to fly around to locate the Dragon Balls. Fortunately, you have the Dragon Radar to assist you. They appear as orange balls on the map and you simply need to fly over them to collect them. If the enemy finds one, you must fight them and defeat them in order to take it away from them. This also works in reverse, as if you lose a fight while in possession of a Dragon Ball, your opponent will take it. Trunks and the others fight the meta callers, but one manages to flee and report to the normal cooler is that what he's called the one that's not made of metal revealing that goku was the one who defeated his brother frieza and is on unamic cooler decides to accompany the meta callers to fight goku before beginning a mission you can select three characters to use the first character is the one you will be in control of your cpu allies will be the other two from the screen you can also customize the characters with boosters and stuff but there is also another option that i didn't figure out until reaching this chapter that is, you must choose the transformation in the character select screen. I couldn't figure out why the characters wouldn't transform, despite having unlocked the transformations. So make certain that you select it here. The transformations still work the same way they did in the first game. So they are extremely unbalanced. It makes no sense that you only need four full key gauges to turn Super Saiyan 3, whose base key is six gauges. This full gauge requirement is largely meaningless in the story mode, as you begin the fight already transformed. In terms of balance, this system is just bad, but in terms of making the characters who should be more powerful more powerful, they are more powerful. What? Who wrote this nonsense? <laughs> Broly also turns up on Planet Namek and is as angry as ever. It turns out that both him and Cooler are working with Babidi, because of course they are. 
Despite this, the Z fighters manage to collect the seven Dragon Balls, and Dende summons Poranga and makes three wishes. The first is to resurrect those who died on New Namek. The second is to destroy the big Getty star, and the third is to restore the destroyed villages. Babidi tries to attack Dende before the third wish is granted. Dende cries out for help, which Poranga interprets as a wish. A mysterious figure appears and stops Babidi. I wonder who it could be. The Z fighters bring Dende to Earth to become the new guardian and have the Dragon Balls on Earth again and remove all tension from the plot. Not that there was much to begin with, but life and death are meaningless. There are a few different branches in this chapter, but they are all just different fail states if you fail to collect the Dragon Balls before the villains. All of the alternative endings pretty much boil down to everyone dies and the universe is doomed. Shit. While the Z fighters were on Unamic, Mr. Satan managed to befriend Boo by giving him a pebble. This may appear trivial, but it's crucial for later on. Deborah attacks Mr. Satan, which enrages Boo and causes him to split in two, making an evil Boo. They fight, with evil Boo eventually devouring good Boo. Yum. Fighting as Super Boo, we must eliminate Deborah. I'm not sure who we should root for, but it's probably Deborah. He has a beard. That's why we should root for him. Super Boo then transforms Deborah into chocolate and consumes him. Yum. The Z fighters return to Earth. Dende restores the Dragon Balls and Tien and Yamcha go to collect them. At the same time, Babadu returns to Earth and discovers that Deborah has been defeated by Super Boo. He then notices a Dragon Ball in Boo's hand, which was the pebble given to him by Mr. Satan. Well done, Story. You done something good. Recognizing that the Dragon Balls have been revived, he sends Super Boo to play with the Z Fighters while he, the Brainwash Caller and Broly go after the Dragon Balls. Playing through this chapter, I can't help but notice that this game's completely unique story is just a retelling of the Boo Saga, but with extra steps. In this chapter, for example, Gohan returns to the sacred world of the Kai to use the Z Sword, but is unable to do so. Instead, they must locate Gohan from the future timeline. In this timeline, future Gohan has already died and they must travel to the other world. This is where all of the extra steps occur, such as when they end up fighting Janimba and then Bardock joins us to fight Boo and it's like, what? The plot gets very derailed, mostly to add in more content to play through. Basically, this is just a long-winded way for me to say that the storytelling is not very good. They simultaneously stick too close to the source material making it feel kind of like a truncated rehash of the Boo Saga, while veering way left field with adding in all these other villains and characters to the point where it becomes unnecessarily convoluted. It doesn't help that the writing once again reads like bad fan fiction. Most of the dialogue is an absolute slog to read through. The writing style is uninteresting, most of the characters feel out of character, if they are written with any character at all. I like the concept of what they're going for, but once again I hate the execution. The best part about the story is they make Gohan powerful again, which is awesome as his character got a bit shafted during the end of Z and post Z. Why, do, why does the writer hate Gohan? Another thing I want to complain about is that future Gohan still has both his arms. I guess you get your missing limbs back when you die. After finding future Gohan, the group returns to the sacred world of the Kai. Future Gohan easily pulls the Z sword out and Gohan shatters it to reveal old Kai. Future Gohan has a... Future Gohan has his potential unlocked and brought back to life by old Kai. Pycon and Bar Pycon and Bardock Pycon and Bardock Bardock Pycon and Bardock are then given one day to help. The old Kai also gives them Pator earrings for fusion. Goku is astounded by how many fighters they have amassed, including his father, which I still find odd, but I'm guessing it's just for fan service, which I think is okay. Ooh. They have managed to collect all the Dragon Balls besides the one that Babidi is in possession of. Babidi appears at the lookout and demands the Dragon Balls, threatening to obliterate the cities if he doesn't get them. While Yancha is distracted, Janaba emerges from the shadows and steals the Dragon Balls from him. 
There are two paths you can take, one to save the cities and the other to pursue Janimba. If you take the top path, Goku and Vegeta will perform a fusion dance and you will be able to play as Gogeta. The Z Fighters reclaim the Dragon Balls after defeating Janimba. However, we still have to go defend the cities, so the decision at the beginning of the chapter didn't really matter much. Broly and Cooler are the ones responsible for attacking the cities. Babidi steals the Dragon Balls during the fight. Not needed anymore? Babidi betrays Broly and Cooler because he's an idiot. Cooler's rage frees him from Babidi's control and causes him to attack the sorcerer, requiring Babidi to use Super Buu to absorb both Broly and Cooler, making Buu even more powerful. The other path is similar in that you go to save the cities, but this time as Gotenks. Buu ends up absorbing Gotenks and Gohan, just as he did in the original story. So Goku and Vegeta fuse into Vegito using the Patora earrings. They deliberately become absorbed in order to free Gotenks and Gohan. I can't help but notice that these branching paths don't add much to the experience. It does add more content, but it lacks meaning. You know what it feels like? It feels like filler. It stinks because it did a great job with the alternative path in Chapter 2. It felt substantial with a ramp up of difficulty while leading to a completely different outcome to the story. But aside from that chapter, the ultimate paths just start to peter out in quality. Babidi summons Shenron, but he is cut off by Mr. Satan, who wishes to become the most popular guy in the universe in order to stop Babidi's evil. Enraged that his wish has been stolen, Babidi attacks Mr. Satan, but Super Buu takes the blow, leaving him near death. Super Buu becomes enraged and devours Babidi. Super Buu transforms into Kid Buu after gaining Babidi's power. However, he suddenly becomes feeling. He suddenly. He suddenly becomes feeling. What the fuck? That doesn't make any sense. This is like one of the worst written scripts I have done so far. <laughs> suddenly he begins feeling intense pain and purposely spits out Good Boo. Kid Boo becomes pure evil after the Good Boo leaves his body. Kid Boo then begins mass producing Super Boo copies, which begin destroying everything. The first time through the section of the game is a complete slog. There are a lot of Boos to fight and they all have a lot of health. This section is actually quite difficult. If you're using a character that has long reach, the AI will try to stay out of that character's range and use quick close range attacks to get in close. On the other hand, if you're using a character that has a lot of powerful attacks, the AI will use a range of defensive and evasive moves to make it harder for you to land hits and will try to take advantage of openings in your defense. All of these factors make the AI and Shin Budokai 2 challenging, but also provide a fun and rewarding experience as you learn how to overcome the AI's tactics and improve your skills. And if everything else fails, there are always boosters, and herein lies one of the game's strengths. The ability to replay sections with any character you want, equipped with whatever boosters you want. Returning to these stages with your powered up character and kicking ass is a lot of fun. It almost feels like this is how the later stages are meant to be played. After fighting through the hordes of super boos, Kid Buu will finally appear. Defeating him will trigger one of two endings, one in which Goku defeats Buu with a spirit bomb, and the other in which Goku, Gohan, Goten, Bardock, and future Gohan use their Kamehamehas to destroy Kid Buu, because apparently Bardock knows the Kamehameha now, even though he doesn't. In game, he does not know it. I think the writers think that it's like a skill that you genetically inherit rather than a skill that you learn. No matter which ending you get, everyone returns to their timeline and everything is hunky-dory once again. Yay! Like I mentioned before, this original story is just the Boo Saga but different and not really in a good way. The Boo Saga's storytelling was already a little sloppy and Shin Budokai 2 only makes it worse. The story mode structure is intriguing with a mix of straight up fights and flying around the world map. And while the world map stages are fun at first and require a bit more strategy, they really start to drag near the end of the game. It gets very repetitive when you have multiple copies of the same enemies to defeat. The game is at its best on subsequent playthroughs when you have access to more powerful characters and more customization options. Aside from the story, there are a few other modes to play. Most of them are just carryovers from the first game, so I'm not going to go over them again. Challenges have been added to the Z Trials section. 
There are 50 challenges to complete. In order to complete the challenge, you must perform a specific action or actions against an opponent. This can range from using a move multiple times to dealing a certain amount of damage in a combo. These challenges are quite fun and it is satisfying to check them off the list. Though some did cause me some difficulty and I had to look up how to do some of them. This is by far the mode I spent the most time in. Other than the story mode of course. Well, maybe not. Shin Budokai 2 includes an arcade mode similar to the first game. However, it does play out slightly differently. In Shin Budokai 1's arcade mode, your fighter has three special battles. The two fighters would converse before the battle. In Shin Budokai 2, a small conversation will precede every single fight. Every character has a unique line of dialogue with every other character. The arcade mode's premise is that you are fighting through the World Martial Arts Tournament, but there isn't even a World Tournament stage in the game, so I call bullshit. Oh no, that's bullshit, isn't it? Dragon Ball Z Shin Budokai 2 is definitely an improvement over the first game. The gameplay is still fantastic and the customization only enhances it further. While the volume and variety of the content in the story mode have increased, the storytelling and storyline remain a bit of a letdown. The game promises a completely new story, but all we got was a fanfiction retelling of the Boo Saga. It becomes a really repetitive slog near the end, to be perfectly honest. The Shin Budokai series have the best gameplay of any Dragon Ball Z fighting game I've played so far, but I just can't get past the story mode's flaws. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm one of those strange people who primarily play these games for the story mode, and this game falls flat on that front. I know I keep repeating myself, but Budokai 3 is still my favourite Dragon Ball Z game. When the seventh generation of consoles arrived on the scene, I was very much looking forward to seeing one of my favourite franchises making its debut in all its HD glory. Unfortunately, when I got my hands on Dragon Ball Z Burst Limit, I found it to be very... <laughs> underwhelming. To the point where this was the last game in the series that I played for a very long time. While I don't remember thinking the game was particularly bad, I do remember feeling like I'd had enough of the series. I was done. I'm hoping that by playing the game again after more than a decade has passed, I'll finally understand why. Dragon Ball Z Burst Limit was released for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 in 2009. The game was developed by Dimps, the same creators of the popular Budokai games. Burst Limit, despite its name, is considered a part of the Budokai series due to its very similar gameplay mechanics. When you first launch Burst Limit, you are greeted by the amazing tune of the game's main theme. I hadn't played the game for 15 years. Oh my god, this game came out 15 years ago. I've only played this game a couple of times in my life, but the opening music has stayed with me. The visuals match the music perfectly, especially when Super Saiyan Goku powers up. The majority of the animations are edited together from in-game cutscenes and look great, but the music is what really makes this opening so memorable. When you get to the title screen, you'll notice that Burst Limit uses the more blocky art style that many Dragon Ball products did around this time. Personally, I prefer the art style seen in the earlier Budokai games, as I enjoy the final line work. And in this art style, the characters have really harsh highlights that make them look kind of plasticky. While I'm not a big fan of the 2D art style, I like how the menus look in this game, although some of the characters, particularly Trunks, are off model. Hello. Yuck, what the fuck? Anyway, enough about the menus. Let's get into the real meat of the game. Blah 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 pride, blah blah prince of all, blah 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 super saiyan, blah blah blah. The story mode in this game is called Z Chronicles. As with most Dragon Ball Z games, it begins with a Saiyan saga. Our first battle is against Goku's brother Raditz. Despite the fact that Burst Limit has cutscenes before, during and after fights, it still relies heavily on text that can be read before entering a battle to provide context for each fight. Before each fight, you can also select the difficulty level you want to play at. Unfortunately, before you can play on hard or very hard, you must first complete the game on normal. And in order to play at the game's hardest Z difficulty, 
you must first beat the game on very hard. This is something that I loathe in any video game. I don't understand the point in gatekeeping difficulty. All it does is punish good players by forcing them to slog through fights that are far too easy for them. It doesn't make the game more accessible to bad players like myself because they can always play on the easier difficulties. It's just stupid. And I'm not just shaming this game for doing it, I'm shaming all games that do it this way. You'll want to play the story mode on at least normal difficulty because certain features will not unlock on lower difficulties. I don't believe the game tells you this anywhere, you just have to know. Or we'll play through the game on easy or very easy and realise you're not unlocking half of what you should. Before the fight, a short intro cutscene will play and you'll be controlling Goku. The gameplay of Burst Limit is a cross between Shin Budokai 2 and Infinite Worlds, which makes sense considering this is a Budokai title. It is most similar to Infinite World as that game was created for those who had not yet upgraded to the 7th generation consoles. Despite the obvious similarities, the gameplay of Burst Limit deviates enough from the other entries in this series to feel quite distinct. Like most games in this genre, you have a health bar that indicates your health, obviously. When playing, you will usually have multiple health bars which are indicated by white rectangles. In the story mode, your starting health is fixed, but in other modes, such as versus mode, you can set it yourself. The fatigue meter, which I will go over in detail a little bit later on, is located on top of the health bar, and at the bottom of the screen is the key gauge, which looks quite different from those seen in earlier Budokai games, and behaves quite differently as well, which I will go over in detail a little bit later. There are also these icons here, which are part of a completely new system known as drama pieces, which I will go over in more detail later on. When Raditz's health reaches zero, the fight ends with a cutscene in which Goku holds Raditz down while Piccolo fires his iconic special beam cannon. Now! Special beam cannon! Raditz and Goku are both killed when the powerful Ki Blast drills through them. A very graphic scene, but not really, because it is heavily censored. Even more so than in Budokai 1, there isn't even like a hole or anything. It just looks like they ran out of breath and fell down. It then unlocks the same fight against Raditz, but this time you play as Piccolo. If you win the fight, the same cutscene will play again. And it is after this fight that the main problem with the way the story is told in this game becomes clear. So after defeating Raditz with Piccolo, you gain access to the fights against the Cybermen, taking command of Tien and Yamcha. However, the game makes no attempt to convey to the player the passage of time. As fans of the anime and manga, we know that one year has passed, and these Cybermen were brought here by Vegeta and Nappa, but the game does nothing to inform the player of this. This story is nearly impossible to follow if you're not a fan. This is true throughout the entire story mode. Almost all context has been removed, leaving only the plot's major bullet points. You might think that the reason for this is that they simply didn't have time to create all these extra cutscenes, which makes sense given how time-consuming animation is, but as will be revealed later in the video, this isn't the case, and the narrative structure of Burst Limit becomes very perplexing. Fighting the Cybermen as Tien and Yamcha is both simple and aggravating. As you are fighting multiple Cybermen at once, and the action must pause each time they switch out, when all of them are taken out, Yamcha gets hugged to death. Help. Police. Murder. Nappa and Vegeta, whoever they are, appear on Earth, and the Z fighters must keep them at bay for as long as possible in order for Goku to return from his training with King Kai in the other world. No, the game does not explain this, but I am going to anyway, because it's my video and I can do what I want, as long as YouTube allows it. You actually fight as Nappa in these two levels. It's really nice that the game gives you a wide range of characters to play as during the story mode, including the villains. Despite the fact this is a 3D fighter, you will mostly be fighting on a two-dimensional plane. You can move left and right to approach or distance yourself from your opponent. You can also dash in both directions. Shift moves allow you to switch between planes. This is great for avoiding big attacks and disorientating your opponent. It may actually be too good at avoiding attacks, making the risk of using teleportation moves, well, not worth the risk. I only mention this because the timing for using teleportation can be extremely strict. 
To the point where it appears to be broken at times, teleports are classified into two types. The one I'm referring to here is known as the ready stance. It is a counter move that must be executed immediately before your opponent's attack hits. This is what gives it such erratic timing. I believe it's a combination of faster animations and a lower frame rate that makes it feel more inconsistent than in previous titles. The ready stance can be used to either get behind your opponent and set up a combo, or to push your opponent away. Melee attacks are divided into three categories, rush attacks, smash attacks and throws. Throws are relatively self-explanatory, you can toss your opponent a short distance if you are right next to them, leaving them vulnerable to a follow-up attack. Rush attacks are fast but rather weak, they are ideal for starting off a combo because they can be performed quickly. Then there are smash attacks that are slow but powerful. They can be charged by holding down the button to unleash a more powerful move. They can break through an opponent's guard. However, you must exercise caution because it will expose you to danger while charging. Furthermore, the majority of smash attacks allow you to attack through. This means that even if your opponent attacks you during the combo, you will continue to perform the moves and take damage as usual. If both players launch a smash attack at the same time, the player who launched it first wins. There are aura actions that are stronger versions of these standard attacks that will stun a fighter for a few seconds. However, in order to use these attacks, you must sacrifice some of your key. Charging up a smash attack is an excellent way to knock your opponent into the air, exposing them to a pursuit attack. This can be followed by either an aerial or ground pursuit. These are easy to perform as the timing is pretty lax. The most difficult part is getting enough time to charge your attack and knock your opponent into the air. Burst Limit is quite fast paced and the AI doesn't give you much breathing room, especially on higher difficulties. To give yourself some breathing room, use the aura action Mega Crush. It's basically just the spirit shot. Goku time! Goku finally arrives and easily defeats Nappa, setting up the showdown with Vegeta, the saga's final boss. Yeah! These cutscenes look fantastic. Thanks to the incredible cell shading style that has been iterated and improved on throughout the Budokai series, it is at its best in Burst Limit. The increased power of the 7th generation consoles enables more detailed models as well as dynamic cloth and hair physics. Reddit's hair has never looked so fabulous. It looks so soft and fluffy. The animations during cutscenes can be a little stiff at times and the game has a habit of reusing animations. Fine. The true highlights however is the gameplay animations, which are pure bliss. They are so quick and snappy and every punch and kick has such a powerful impact. All of the key blasts just ooze style and when they go off they create quite a spectacle. The presentation of this game is excellent. The music is excellent, the voice acting is excellent and can be played in both English and Japanese, and the sound effects are excellent as always. But, and this is a big but, for whatever reason, they decided to cover up this fantastic looking game with Vaseline. It has a strange blurry effect in the background that looks terrible. It's as if someone turned up the motion blur to the point where it blurs even when there's no motion. It may help the characters stand out from the background, but I find it distracting. Especially since the game only runs at 30 frames per second, but when it comes to recreating some of the anime's most iconic moments, they really go all out. <laughs> I did it. So, you must be Frieza. Actually, it's Lord Freezer. 
Really? Then why is there an I in it? When a new saga is unlocked, the Z Chronicles menu screen will change to reflect the saga, but unfortunately it is filled with spoilers. What? Goku turned Super Saiyan? How do you spoil it? The Freezer Saga begins after the Z Fighters have arrived on planet Namek. The first battle pits Vegeta against Raku. You'll notice that the game uses the same Vegeta model as in the Saiyan Saga. This means he still has his tail, which had been permanently severed by Yajirobe at this point in the story. And it's not like there isn't a version of Vegeta's model without a tail, as it appears a few fights later. It's just one of those things that appears to be a simple fix, but they ran out of time or something. They have so much attention to detail in the cutscenes during fights that they must have noticed. Aside from cutscenes that play at the beginning and the end of a fight, there are others that will play during a fight. Drama Pieces is a new gameplay mechanic that has been added. When certain criteria are met during a fight, a cutscene will interrupt the action. Characters can be given specific abilities, enhancements, attack nullifications and other benefits. The goal of the mechanic is to help Dragon Ball Z Burst Limits gameplay feel more like the anime. Drama pieces can be equipped to characters in the same way that a support capsule can be equipped to a character in Budokai 1, 2 or 3. During battle, drama pieces are displayed directly beneath each character's health bar and are distinguished by various logos such as a fist, heart, explosion or question mark. In Z Chronicles, you can obtain these by performing specific actions during battle. There are plethora. There are plethora. There are plethora. Why did I have to use that word? There are a plethora of requirements to meet when unlocking drama pieces throughout the story mode, with a total of 95 of them. There will be a list of drama pieces available at the end of each fight. The game will also give you a ranking, but it doesn't really matter since there are no Zenny rewards or anything. I like the idea of drama pieces, and when you first start playing the game, there are a fun mechanic to see what happens when you play in a certain way. However, there comes a point when they become extremely disruptive to the gameplay. When one is activated, it stops everything and returns each fighter to their starting stances. They disrupt the flow of a fight and it's especially annoying when one activates while you're in the middle of a combo. I've had them activate right before performing an ultimate move and the game would drain all of my key before I could even perform the attack. Such bullshit. Oh no, that's bullshit. They become so prolific during some fights that it becomes infuriating. You can see I was trying to skip it here, but you can't skip them. Drama pieces can be disabled in certain modes, but not while playing the story mode, which while annoying makes sense, because the Z Chronicles mode rely on these drama pieces to tell some of its story, what little there is of it. When Goku is fighting Captain Ginyu, Ginyu realises he is outmatched. He then stabs himself in the chest before taking over Goku's body with his body swap ability, hoping that the real Goku will die due to blood loss. Yes, I am still filling in some gaps that are left by the story mode, but that is what the game is implying is going on. I'd like to take this opportunity to discuss the game's AI and how bizarre it can be at times. Now during my playthrough, I played on normal the entire time and the AI was generally quite good. They provided a nice challenge and would make good use of the game's mechanics. They are aggressive but not relentless. However, there were times when the AI played extremely defensively. This was most noticeable when I was fighting Captain Ginyu, who had taken over Goku's body. He basically just stood there guarding the entire time and refused to fight. Think of me. Fight back! You coward, fight back! This happened to Gohan during the Cell Saga as well. Yeah, Gohan is a bit of a pacifist, but I really don't think this was intentional. It's just really strange. I have no idea what's causing it. It's as if the AI forgets how to fight. It wouldn't be a Dragon Ball Z game without key attacks. The key gauge at the bottom of the screen indicates how much key you have. Less key means you can only use physical attacks, whereas more key allows you to use key attacks more frequently. When you use a vanishing move, key blast or super move, your key gauge will decrease. When it is full, you can use it to perform an ultimate move or transform both of which completely deplete it. The number of levels on your key gauge is determined by your ultimate move, which can be picked at the start of a fight. One thing I found rather odd about Burst Limit is that there is no way to manually power up your key. You know, like... I'm sorry, I just looked like I was trying to take a shit. But you get what I mean. Small key blasts can be fired while dashing or between combos, but they only deal chip damage. 
If you press the guard button at the right time, you can deflect them away from or back at your opponent. This is the move I was having trouble with when attempting to teleport. Instead, I'll keep initiating the deflect. I believe it's because the timing and inputs are so similar that you will sometimes end up deflecting when you really want to teleport behind your opponent. Or maybe it's just because they suck. Can't be bad. <laughs> Super attacks consume more key but are more potent. They can also be charged up for increased damage. EX supers are the same but can be executed at full power without charging but require a bit more key up front. When two super attacks collide, a beam struggle occurs and you must mash the face buttons as quickly as possible to increase your chances of winning the struggle. Although this like hardly ever happens, like I think it happened not even once <laughs> during my entire playthrough of the story mode. Your ultimate attacks are the most powerful key attacks. This is the attack you will equip to your character prior to a fight. These attacks will also determine the size of your key gauge, which has a significant impact on a fight since the size of the key gauge also affects other mechanics. After the Ginyu force is defeated, the rest of the saga is a series of battles against Frieza in his various forms. <laughs> I would really prefer if you would be quiet. Brass Limit's camera is much more dynamic than those found in the previous Budokai games. It follows the action well for the most part, but it struggles when characters begin shifting and teleporting in quick succession. The characters in true Dragon Ball Z fashion begin moving so quickly that you can sometimes lose track of where you are and the camera will freak out a little. While it can be visually disorientating, it actually does an excellent job of not interfering with your directional inputs. It's almost as if the game has a built-in tank control system that buffers your inputs from when you started the combo rather than when you finished it. Okay, I realize I'm doing a terrible job of explaining this, but I don't know how to describe it in words. My point is that despite the camera's erratic behavior, the controls remain consistent. In the options menu, you can disable this active camera. When turned off, it will simply remain to the side of the character, as in previous titles. Freezer kills Krillin. Enraged, this triggers Goku to transform into a Super Saiyan. No, you, you monster! Dare you! How, how dare you! Transformations can be used whenever a character's key gauge is full and they have a transformation, obviously. Each form increases your attack power while decreasing your defense. You also must change directly into the next level. For example, as Goku, you cannot go directly to Super Saiyan from his base form. You must first go through Kaioken. You will lose your transformation if you have high fatigue and are hit with a smash attack. The most disappointing thing about the transformations is the severe lack of them. The game's highest sand form is Super Saiyan 2, which is only available to Team Gohan. When compared with Budokai 3, which went all the way up to Super Saiyan 4, Burst Limit feels like a lot of stuff is missing, which is a reoccurring theme when it comes to this game. Speaking of missing things, remember how I said earlier that this game lacks a lot of context for its story? Vegeta and Nappa, for example, appear in a fight but are never shown beforehand. After completing the Freezer saga, you It will play a series of recap sequences depicting the events of both the Saiyan and Freezer sagas, as well as all of these extra cutscenes. For example, Vegeta and Nappa showing up on Earth. Why was this not shown earlier? It also shows Raditz kidnapping Gohan. I didn't even mention it, which you probably didn't even notice because you just already knew that's why he was there. It's just implied, which you can get away with with fans, but like with many Dragon Ball Z games before and after it, Burst Limit does a terrible job of conveying the Dragon Ball Z story, especially for those who don't know it well. 
or at all. Now many make the argument that story modes and fighting games don't matter, but I disagree. If a game lacks a significant single player component, it has essentially become a disposable product. When the online is dead, then you just move on to the next one. To me, Dragon Ball Z is about more than just the fighting, it's about the story, and I want the games to reflect that, which I don't think is an unreasonable expectation. I realise I'm being very negative about the story right now, but that's only because there's so much effort and care put into what's here. Like you could never look at this game and say that they weren't trying or they didn't give a shit. The cutscenes are absolutely amazing, it's just missing so many pieces. It really feels like they just ran out of time. I guess I'm just disappointed because I can see what could have been. The following contains violence, coarse language and adult situations not suitable for minors. Viewer discretion is advised. Using the trigger buttons, you can freely switch between sagas. The level select layout is unnecessarily cluttered. Its layout is similar to a mind map, but it lacks a central point. So I guess it's nothing like a mind map. I don't even know why I said that. <laughs> All of the levels are numbered, so you know which order they should be played in, but they aren't always unlocked in that order. Because you can sometimes unlock multiple levels at once, when you return to the menu, it will default to the most recent level. The layout, I believe, is intended to indicate when events are taking place. Like these fights are happening at the same time, I think. But if this wasn't the intention, it should have just been a list or something because this looks terrible. Much of the Android slash Cell saga is skipped in this game. Everything leading up to the Android's reveal is missing. So no Trunks annihilating Mecha Freezer, and Android 19 and 20 aren't even mentioned. The saga begins with a sparring match between Goku and Gohan. Because Gohan is already a teenager, I'm assuming this occurs after the 3 year time skip, but the game doesn't make this clear. The game then goes straight to the fight with Vegeta getting his butt kicked by Android 18. Of course you won't always be on the offensive when fighting. You'll also need to use blocking and evasion moves to get the upper hand on your opponents. Holding down the guard button will block most attacks, but keep an eye out for incoming smash attacks, which will break right through a standard guard. Holding down the ultimate guard button will surround you and key, shielding you from all of your opponent's attacks, except throws. As such, it's ideal when you're at a distance, but keep in mind that using this move quickly depletes your key gauge, so make sure you use it at the right time. If you press the guard button just as your opponent attack is about to hit you, your character will dodge, allowing you to counter immediately. Dodging, on the other hand, causes your fatigue gauge to rise, even when a dodge fails. So there is a penalty for just spamming dodge. After being attacked, you may be knocked to the ground, leaving you vulnerable to further attacks. However, if you tap any of the four main face buttons right before hitting the ground, you'll perform a roll, putting a distance between you and any follow-up attacks from your opponent. Piccolo attempts to eliminate the androids before Cell can absorb them, but is unable to do so and Android 18 is absorbed. Despite the fact that many of the fights in the story mode begin with the characters already transformed, this is only possible in the story mode. In other game modes, such as the versus mode, you will always begin in the base form of a fighter. The story mode actually eliminates a lot of the game's limited customization. A character's ultimate and drama pieces are all pre-selected. However, in other modes, you can select these for yourself. As Cell absorbs the androids and grows in power, the game will constantly switch between characters. With a few exceptions, each character's movements are performed using a standard set of commands. This is a bit of a... This is, this is a bit, this is a bit, ugh, the fuck am I on about? This is a bit of a double-edged sword, as many characters feel very similar apart from their unique ultimate attacks. This is not true for all characters though. For example, Piccolo has much greater reach, Trunks uses a sword, and the larger characters such as Android 16 move a little slower. The shared control schemes have the advantage of allowing you to perform their moves regardless of which character the story forces you to play as. With Vegeta's help, Cell was able to achieve his perfect form. Cell has decided to hold a tournament to determine the fate of the world. The Z Fighters have a week in order to prepare themselves for the Cell games. Burst Limit has a very comprehensive tutorial that does an excellent job of teaching the player the game's various mechanics. It walks you through the moves step by step, with Piccolo, Krillin and finally Goku explaining them to Gohan. It will then show you the controls on the screen and have you perform the moves to ensure you understand how to do each one. The premise for these training segments correspond to each saga. Piccolo's training takes place during the Saiyan saga after Goku's death, with Piccolo preparing Gohan for the arrival of Vegeta and Nappa. 
Krillin's tutorials take place on Namek while searching for the Dragon Balls, and Goku's training session is set just before the Cell games. The tutorial actually depicts the passage of time better than the story mode does. The Cell games begin with a battle between Cell and Goku. Why did I say it like that? And due to the progressively large health bars, fights and burst limit can be quite lengthy. This is why you must pay attention to your character's fatigue. The fatigue gauge indicates how much more evasion and blocking a character can do before collapsing from exhaustion. When the gauge is full, your character will be stunned for a few seconds, making you vulnerable to attacks. You can step out of the state by mashing the face buttons. Each time you block, evade or take damage, the meter fills slightly, but there are some actions that actually help to lower it. Entering Aura Spark Mode gradually reduces fatigue, and Transforming reduces fatigue by a percentage based on the size of your character's key gauge. If there are 5 bars, it will be reduced by 50%, 4 bars will be reduced by 40 3 bars will be reduced by 30%, and so on. Well, actually not and so on, because I don't think there are any other sizes. I'm glad there is a simple way to lower the fatigue meter, because that was one of the things I disliked about the fatigue system in Infinite World that there wasn't an obvious way to lower it. However, in Burst Limit, these mechanics can be planned around and used as a backup if you get into a jam. I mean, if it were up to me, I'd prefer no fatigue system because I'm more of a casual player and believe it would be more fun without it, but the way it is here does not irritate me like it did in Infinite World. Honestly, it just seems like it was better thought out. The game features a visually stunning recreation of Gohan's transformation into Super Saiyan 2, following the destruction of Android 16. Like I mentioned before, Gohan is the only character in the game that is able to transform into Super Saiyan 2, even though later there is a cutscene of Goku achieving the form. Vegeta and Trunks do have their Buffy ascended Super Saiyan form, or whatever it's called, but that's it. The lack of transformations is kind of sucky, but there is the Aura Spark mechanic that acts as sort of an alternative, and even characters without transformations can make use of it. When you release your key, you will enter Aura Spark mode. Normal key blasts will behave like charged key blasts in this mode. You will take less damage from normal attacks and you will recover from fatigue. While in this mode, your key slowly drains, and when it reaches zero, you revert back to your normal state. However, your key will not decrease immediately after activating Aura Spark, so you can still use your ultimate attack before your key begins to decrease. Aura Spark enables you to use the Vanishing Move, which is essentially ready stance but is far more convenient to use because you can teleport whenever you want and don't have to worry about timing it with your opponent's attack. By spending a small amount of key, you can avoid the risk of using ready stance entirely. There is also a more powerful form of the pursuit attack called the ultimate move attack. That's such a dumb name. The ultimate move attack. It works the same as a normal pursuit, except there will be a button mashing war in the air. If you prefer to play defensively, Aura Spark may be a better choice than transforming. You don't get an attack boost, but you will take less damage, and will have an easier time moving around the battlefield thanks to the vanishing move. Cell is defeated by Gohan using the iconic father and son Kamehameha. The game then progresses to the Boo Saga. 
Except it doesn't because this game only goes up to the end of the Cell Saga. It does unlock a what if scenario with Goku's father Bardock and also a few levels where you play as Broly just destroying everyone. But these segments aren't very long and they don't really tell that much of a story. I guess the story of Broly is angry and killing everyone is the story but it's honestly not very interesting. Aside from the Z Chronicles, Burst Limit has an offline and online versus mode, as well as trials. I obviously did not play the online mode, but the core fighting mechanics are fantastic, so I'm going to assume that it was at least good. The controls are fluid and intuitive for both newcomers and veterans, especially the movement mechanics, which strike an excellent balance of speed and accessibility. Dodging actions cause the camera to shift around the battlefield, giving the impression that you're fighting in three dimensions, though these camera movements can make reading your opponent's actions a little difficult at times. Overall, I believe Burst Limit strikes a good balance of accessibility and complexity. After an hour or two of practice, you should be able to grasp the game's fighting system and not feel restricted to using only one character. It's not as harsh as an infinite world, but it still provides a really good challenge, especially on higher difficulties. Dragon Ball Z Burst Limit's biggest flaw is that it feels very incomplete when compared to previous titles, particularly Infinite World, which covered Dragon Ball GT and some of the movies. Although Infinite World had the advantage of being essentially an expansion to Budokai 3, it was able to reuse a ton of assets, it was running on the same engine and only came out on one system, the PS2. Burst Limit was the first Dragon Ball Z game released for 7th generation consoles, and the developers had to start from scratch. This is probably why it feels like a Budokai 1 remake. In many ways, this game felt like a step back from the franchise, which turned me off from playing anymore. If any Dragon Ball Z game is in need of a sequel, it's this one. What is here is of very high quality. It's just lacking a bit in quantity. The 6th generation, like most console generations, didn't go out in a sudden blaze of glory, but rather with a slow, drawn out whimper. With the last of its releases having the benefit of an entire generation of technology optimization, but with the significant disadvantage of being regarded outdated upon their arrival. Some titles were given new life, while others were sadly left behind. And one of these titles was Dragon Ball Z Infinite World. Infinite World was the last Dragon Ball Z game to be released on the PlayStation 2, coming out in 2008, which was already three years into the seventh generation of consoles. Even I, who had always been behind the times in terms of adopting new consoles, had already made the switch. It was released for those who did not have access to Dragon Ball Z Burst Limit, which was released earlier that year. So this game entirely slipped under my radar, although I do recall seeing it in stores, but I had no idea this game was the sequel to Budokai 3, my favourite Dragon Ball Z game, due to the bootleg looking cover and the name. I mean look at this cover, it looks slapped together in like 5 minutes. It looks like I made it. I'm not sure why this game isn't called Budokai 4. Even though it has some similarities to Burst Limit, it is much closer to emulating Budokai 3's gameplay. Despite the fact that it was launched so late into the PS2's life cycle, I believe that people would have been more interested in the game if it had been branded as part of the Budokai series. They did that with the Tenkaichi series and it tricked me as a kid thinking Budokai Tenkaichi was the sequel to Budokai 3. It just seems really weird that they didn't take advantage of brand recognition. The initial reception of Infinite World was not great, with critics citing that the game felt identical to Budokai 3, but is this actually the case? The opening cinematic for Infinite World features a really nice 3D graphical style. It's very colourful and vibrant, which I appreciate a lot. The characters are true to their designs and the auras and key blasts provide some stunning visual effects. The music is upbeat and complements the visuals. The animation though has to be the opening's biggest flaw. It's not horrible, it just seems a little stiff in certain places. And also the eyes. It's always in the eyes. 
I adore all of the villains reveals, with the exception of Jan Ember, who suffers the most from the stiffness. Where do you want to be off first? Also, Goku might be a little too infatuated with this Dragon Ball. Call the police. The game takes on a very similar look to Budokai 3, and I mean very similar. At first glance, it looks exactly the same, but it does have some slight differences. The most evident difference is the HUD is different. It looks worse in my opinion, but I wouldn't call it bad. While in combat, it's rather easy to read. I suppose it's mainly the awful grey colour that bothers me. It also has an additional meter, which we'll discuss later. The amazing cell shading graphics have returned and they still look great. Some of the characters' faces are a little strange, but you can recognise who they are. The majority of the animations, at least for the returning characters, are carried over from Budokai 3. The new characters, of course, have new animations which are fantastic. They are fast paced and intense, even more so than in Budokai 3. I'm not sure whether I'm imagining things, but I believe it's because they increased the camera shake. In any case, landing the attacks feels really powerful and satisfying. The menus are nearly identical to those in Budokai 3, with minor tweaks, and the music is composed entirely of tracks from prior Budokai games, along with some remixed tracks. Which isn't a negative thing, because I really enjoy the Budokai's plagiarised soundtracks but you'll undoubtedly notice how little has changed since Budokai 3, which is why some people may have assumed it was a lazy copy and paste job. But it's in the gameplay that you'll notice the major differences. Infinite World is a side-on fighter similar to the rest of the series, in which you can punch, kick, grab, oh, fuck. throw key blasts, and block. So quite similar, but these are just the fundamentals of the gameplay, and the differences between Budokai 3 and Infinite World have a big impact on the combat. The newly added Aura Dash, which allows you to dash around the battlefield swiftly, while also allowing you to teleport, dramatically speeds up battles. You can now teleport without instantly pushing your opponent away, giving you the opportunity to attack from behind. When you initially enter a match, the AI is one of the first things you'll notice. While in other Budokai games, the AI sometimes had the habit of standing around and sniffing their own ass. In Infinite World, they are far more interested in kicking your ass. This game's AI is ruthless. They are very aggressive, even on the normal and easy difficulty levels. They make excellent use of the mechanics, even dodging and counter-attacking at the appropriate times. They will beat you to a pulp if you are not prepared. Oh. On the hardest difficulty settings, it feels as if they're reading your inputs, which let's face it, they probably are. But even playing the game on normal provided a great challenge. It caught me off guard at the beginning, but it did give me a good reason to go into the practice and dueling mode to get better at the game, which I never really had to do with any of the other Budokai games. Infinite World is definitely the hardest in the series by far, but because of this and the practice that I put in, I think I'm actually the best at it. Dragon Rush was thankfully removed from Infinite World. During a fight, you'd have to play a paper scissors rock type minigame, which was quite annoying. I'm glad they got rid of this because it was entirely luck based and the long animation sequences would disrupt the flow of battle. It was entertaining the first couple of times, but then it would happen again and again with the identical animations regardless of who you were playing as. Aura Burn Mode replaced Hyper Mode, giving you infinite key for a certain amount of time and preventing you from being knocked back by basic attacks. While in this state, it also boosts your attack and defensive stats slightly. The downside of using this mode is that it progressively depletes your key until it reaches zero. However, unlike in Budokai 3's hyper mode, you won't become fatigued if your key drops to zero. So the downside isn't really much of a downside. You don't need to be in aura burn mode to perform an ultimate attack like you did in the previous game with hyper mode. To launch an ultimate attack, you just need to meet the key requirements. Now just because aura burn mode does not cause fatigue does not imply that the mechanic has been removed. This is why you have an extra bar on your HUD. As you fight, fatigue builds up. Taking damage, dodging and guarding all contribute to the fatigue meter filling up. And if you are struck when it's full, your character will get fatigued. You can't move and will return back to your base form while in this state. Unfortunately, there is no way to decrease the fatigue meter. Like, if we were people, hypothetically, staying out of a fight for a bit or powering up should at least alleviate fatigue a little bit. But no, I don't mind the fatigue system that much, but it does feel really annoying when you're doing really well and you see the bar getting close to filling up 
and there isn't much you can do about it. It's also really easy to get juggled in the air when you're about to enter the fatigue state, since the animation doesn't start until your character touches the ground. Actually, I think I just talked myself out of it. I don't like the fatigue system. Overall, I enjoyed the changes they made to the gameplay. The core mechanics haven't changed, but the tweaks have sped up the fights and movement just enough to make it feel like a fresh experience. The difficulty is high, especially if you've never played a Budokai game before, but it forces you to use all of the game's mechanics to overcome the challenge. However, there is a huge misstep that Infinite World took. They got rid of beam struggles. Boo! You stink! Infinite World's story mode is called Dragon Mission. It places you on a map where you run around as Goku, interacting with certain spots on said map. If you're one of those people who are disappointed that the cutscenes had been pretty much missing since Budokai 1, well you can turn that frown inside out because they are back. With a new cell shaded style and some all new scenes that weren't shown in Budokai 1, such as the Boo Saga. The animation is pretty decent and I really like the way the models look. Some of the cutscenes do look like they are straight up copied from Budokai 1 though. The framing and movement is almost identical. However, this is not a problem with the sagas that were not included in the first Budokai game. Unfortunately, some of the audio for the English voice track is really out of sync. I understand that it's difficult to match up the lip flaps to the English dialogue, but it is quite distracting in some scenes. Sucks. Oh, I do this for you. And even for you, <laughs> The story mode covers the Saiyan Saga, the Freezer Saga, the Cell Saga, Dragon Ball GT and another story, which are movie fights. Though not all sagas are created equal, as there is a noticeable drop in content in both the GT Saga and for another story. Which really sucks since the other sagas have been covered so extensively in the other Budokai games, it would have been a nice change of pace for this game to focus on the lesser covered content. There are your basic fighting missions where you must defeat a certain opponent to clear it. Before entering a fight, a menu will open, allowing you to change the difficulty, see the controls, the mission description and customise your character's skills. Infinite World still uses the capsule system, but this time around it has been greatly improved. Now you have different slots for different types of capsules. You can buy up to two additional upgrade slots for your character in the shop. The leveling system of Budokai 3 has been thrown away, but now instead of leveling your character, you equip higher level capsules. For example, now only the level 5 transformation capsule needs to be equipped in order for Goku to transform into Super Saiyan 4, rather than the acquired 5 in Budokai 3. This is a far superior system because you have more slots to work with, allowing you to better customise your character to your liking. This system also gives you another option to tackle the game's difficulty. You can either lower the difficulty setting, get good or get better capsules to upgrade your fighters so you have more tools at your disposal. But if you can't win any of the fights, how are you supposed to earn Zenny to buy the capsules from the shop? Oh jeez, he's taking it pretty rough. It's pathetic. Find some honor and defeat for God's sake. You must be great from that glass house of yours. <laughs> well, not only does the story mode have fighting missions, it also has mini games you can play. There are several different ones that you will unlock as you progress through the story. The first one you get to play requires you to run around as Goku, jumping through hexagonal checkpoints for some reason. There are a couple of variations of this mini game, but they all control basically the same. You have to jump through all of the checkpoints before time runs out. The higher the difficulty, the more checkpoints there are. There are coins that you can collect to earn extra zenny. There is also vials that can be picked up to refill your key. Key is needed to dash forward, which can be done either on the ground or in the air. You can also charge up your key manually. You can jump and double jump to traverse high ledges. The controls are what really lets this mini game down. The jump feels very heavy and it has almost no horizontal movement. You drop like a ton of bricks and it really makes you wish that you could just fly. The camera is just awful for looking around. There is a version of this mini game where instead of jumping through checkpoints, you're destroying radars. Once you have destroyed all of the radars, you can use the dragon radar to find the dragon ball. Dragon balls can be found in other levels too, but you can just replay this mission until you obtain all seven. But it kind of isn't worth collecting them, as all you get is a random capsule that you can easily just buy from the shop. Wow, that's your dragon? 
Our dragon would literally wear him like a scarf. The flying minigame is the same concept as the on the ground missions, except of course you're flying. These missions are much more fun since you can move much faster and the controls aren't as bad. They also take place on Budokai 3's overworld map. Training minigames involve pressing the correct buttons at the correct time, so basically a rhythm game. There are several different ones but they all boil down to the same thing. I found these games to be the most fun on higher difficulties, even though I'm really bad at them. Damn, damn, damn it, shit! The higher the difficulty, the faster the prompts appear and the more buttons you must press. The most unique training mission requires Goku to catch bubbles. I really hated this mini game. Bubbles will constantly be dropping bananas on the ground for you to slip on, and he'll also throw them at you too, you little bastard. Grabbing him is a real pain because it's so easy to miss due to the delay between pressing the grab button and Goku actually jumping forward to grab him. The final mini game type is the shooting mini games. Listen carefully. I, Vegeta, Prince of All Saiyans, would like to offer you, Kakarot, the opportunity to stand beside me in this conquest. With Nappa gone, I could use a good man. Okay, so not with guns, but using key blasts. You'll usually be shooting at the opponent to either stop them coming near you, like with Sal, or until you hit them the required amount of times. Some you can just get away with spamming key blasts, but others require proper timing. I thought these sections were at best okay, I never went out of my way to replay them on the harder difficulties, like I did with some of the training missions. While I didn't enjoy all of the minigames, I did really like their variety they added to the story mode. They do get a bit repetitive, especially the checkpoint minigame, and the controls aren't the best, so I can definitely see why some people wouldn't like them. But you only have to do them once, and if you really can't be bothered, you can just set them to very easy and just breeze through. I had a lot of fun playing through the story mode. I do wish they would have kept the same map style as in Budokai 3, because flying is just more fun than walking. The storytelling still has the same issues as the other Budokai games, where it glosses over most of the detail, and it really does start to peter out quite a bit in the later sagas, with hardly any cutscenes and just way less content in general. When you have completed the story mode once as Goku, more content will open up, such as playing as other characters. Once it is complete, you can go and buy the Fighter's Road capsule, which unlocks a new mode. Infinite World has a few different game modes to choose from, with Fighter's Road being the only one that is not unlocked from the start. In this mode, you fight against a ton of opponents, unlocking new capsules and earning lots of money. The opponents are more difficult and there are a lot of them. Yeah, I wasn't really into this mode, but it is a great way to get capsules. There is no tournament mode in this game, which is a kind of weird omission since it has become a staple of the series. I have no idea why they left it out, as you can still fight on the world tournament stage. Of course there is a practice mode where you can practice. I know, it's pretty shocking. The tutorial isn't actually in this mode, it's part of the story mode. You'll have a character go through each of the game's mechanics and when you perform them enough times you can move on. The tutorials are not very good. They explain what they want you to do, but they don't really explain how to do them very well. They are completely optional though, and honestly you're better off just jumping into practice mode or dueling mode to figure out how to play. Dueling mode is just the same as in the other Budokai games, where you can set up fights against the computer or against another player. You can customise the settings and the character capsules to whatever configuration you like, and any of the characters that you have unlocked can be played in this mode. There are 8 new characters added to Infinite World. GT Goku, Great Saiyaman 2, Pan, Pycon, Super Android 17, Super Baby, Jan and Ba, and GT Vegeta. Most of the characters have returned from Budokai 3, but not all of them. Supreme Kai, Oob, and Cell Jr. are no longer in the game, and the weirdest omission has to be Kid Goku, as he is on the loading screen but isn't actually in the game anymore. There are plenty of costumes to choose from for each character. I'm wearing tights instead of pants! And every character was given an ultimate this time. Yay! As for the stages, well that is a bit of a letdown as there are no new stages. They are all the same as the ones found in Budokai 3. Even the environmental destruction cutscenes for the stages are the same. Dragon Ball Z Infinite World is an awesome game and I wish I had played it earlier. 
Yes, it is very iterative of the third entry, but the gameplay has changed up enough to make it feel like its own thing. The story mode was a lot of fun to play through, and while the mini games definitely aren't for everyone, I really love the variety they brought to the game. I think I still prefer Budokai 3, mostly due to nostalgia, because I'm an old hag stuck in her ways. But I think Infinite World has the better gameplay. They improved the capsule system, got rid of Dragon Rush, and made the AI way more engaging to play against. After playing this game, it really makes me question what they are doing when it came to the Budokai HD collection. If they are going to leave out Budokai 2, then surely they could have added this game in its place. Is it because it wasn't called Budokai 4, or were they just being lazy? This collection isn't really a collection at all, since half of the games are missing. I passed over Infinite World when it came out way back in 2008, opting to play Burst Limit instead, and I think that was a mistake. Infinite World, by all accounts, is Budokai 4, which was exactly what I was looking for. Dragon Ball Evolution can best be described as... Yeah, the movie is pretty bad. So it's not much of a stretch to assume that the game based on it would be just as bad, but it's not that simple. This game was developed by Dims, the same creators of the Budokai series, and more importantly they are the creators of the Shin Budokai series too which had seen its second entry two years prior to this game's release. This game is essentially Shin Budokai 3. I'm being serious. I mean, look at this. I imagine this game carries a lot of stigma due to what it's based on. It's not as bad as you'd assume, but that doesn't mean that it's good. Dragon Ball Evolution the game is based on the movie that is based on the anime that is based on the manga. It was released on the PlayStation Portable on the 8th of April 2009, two days before the movie came out. So if you are very eager to experience the story of Dragon Ball Evolution, gamers could do so early. Those poor bastards. What can I say? This game looks like shit. The PSP just isn't powerful enough to pull off a realistic art style. Gone are the stylus cell shaded models of the Budokai games, and instead we have a bunch of generic and bland looking characters with muddy textures. Since they are restricted to emulating the way the characters looked in the movie, there is just no artistic flair to any of them. The flat lighting also doesn't help. The aura and key effects are very muted, and most don't stand out all that much. But when they do use flashier moves like the Kamehameha, they look out of place, so it's kind of a lose-lose situation. They either look underwhelming or clash with the art style. Even their character portraits look like shit. They're just photos of the actors with what looks like a shitty Photoshop filter applied to them. It's so low effort. None of the characters show any emotions, so it can be hard to tell how the dialogue is meant to be coming across. The game uses the same storytelling style as in the Shin Budokai games, with there being characters talking to each other through text boxes, but sometimes events happen and it's explained really badly through the text box, and the characters start saying all these things like, watch out for the lava, and you're like, what lava? What the fuck is going on? They really need more visuals to help with these cutscenes, because the writing just isn't good enough to convey to the player exactly what is happening. The portraits slide around the screen trying to convey action, but it looks really stupid. Kinda like a kid smashing their action figures together. Okay, not like that. Piccadilly whore! Yeah, like that. There are a few fully animated cutscenes in the story mode. While the animation is bad, the sound design is even worse. There are often sound effects missing from the scenes, and it just makes them awkward as fuck. 
there is never any voices in the cutscenes either, which is weird considering they never seem to shut up during gameplay. At least for this game, they do have some different music, and it's not just the Budokai 3 soundtrack again, 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 again. I have to say that the stages actually look pretty decent. There aren't very many of them, but the ones that they do have look quite nice. I especially like the one that takes place inside Goku's mind. Yeah, it makes sense in the movie. Well, nothing in the movie makes sense, so I don't know, nothing makes sense. And the tournament stage you fight on during the credits is pretty cool. Oh uh, yeah, you actually get to fight during the credits. It's a really nice feature, and I wouldn't mind seeing it in other games. The gameplay is Shin Budokai 2's gameplay but stripped down a bit. For instance, there are no transformations, no flying, and worst of all, no customization. You got a health bar, a guard bar, and a key gauge. Although I don't like how they've put the key gauge at the bottom. Now you have to glance at both the bottom and the top of the screen to get all of the information. It's objectively worse. You still have the light and heavy attacks that can be followed up with <laughs> You still have the light and heavy attacks that can be followed up by a rush attack. You'll find that a lot of the characters have less ranged attacks, so a lot of the time you'll be focused on getting up and close to your opponent. Thankfully the aura burst system is still here. If your character has enough key, they can use the aura burst ability to increase their attack power and movement speed. It takes half a key bar to activate aura burst, and the rest of the bar is steadily depleted with each subsequent action. While in aura burst mode, all movement will result in an aura dash, so you can use it for quick escapes or to get behind the opponent. The aura rush is a charge that bypasses everything but ultimates. The aura slam attack cannot be blocked, and while it can be cancelled into, it is easily interrupted. When using aura guard, even ultimate attacks are completely negated, but throws, fully charged slam attacks and aura slams can still break it. Still, it's annoying that the AI has such a bad habit of spamming this move. Aura burst charge is now called full burst, and it works just the same with each character getting their own unique buff. There are technically 11 characters in the game, but I would argue that there's really only 10. Because Neo Piccolo is just Piccolo, but with a scarf. One thing this game has going for it is you can play as Bulma and Chi Chi, which you very rarely get to do. But unfortunately it's not the version of the character that people actually like. This is still Dragon Ball Evolution. <coughs> okay. You can also play as this. Bulma is quite a fun character. She uses a pair of pistols in place of key attacks. In fact, there are a few characters that utilize weapons, which is a nice change of pace. Bulma has this RNG attack where she throws a capsule at the opponent, and it can either be a teddy bear or a motorbike. It's a really creative way to incorporate the iconic capsule into combat. You can also fight as Ozaru, who is a lot smaller than I was expecting. Not about no, size, about how you use a baby. Yep. The controls are the same, a lot of the attacks have been reused, a lot of the animations have been reused. The gameplay is fantastic because it's basically Shin Budokai 2, but with a really sad reskin. The story mode of this game is a retelling of the Dragon Ball Evolution movie, and if you would like to hear my full thoughts on that, I have created a video about it, but to put it in the briefest way possible, it's terrible and I hate it. And shame on you, 20th Century Fox. The story mode is just a the story mode is just a bunch of fights that take place in between the visual novel segments. Here's a reenactment of playing these story segments. It's too fast! How could you even tell what's on? Yeah, I can tell. You mostly play as Goku, but there are a few fights where you get to control someone else. The story mode isn't very difficult and your only goal is to defeat your opponent. Apart from in this one fight. During the fight between Master Roshi and Piccolo, you must defeat Piccolo using the Mafuba which is Roshi's ultimate attack. It only does this one time in the entire story. They didn't even do this with the final fight between Goku and Piccolo, which is probably the most appropriate, as the Kamehameha, Goku's ultimate attack, is how Piccolo was defeated in the movie. This game's recreation of it somehow looks better. I just hate the way the Kamehameha looks in the film. It's so... You know what I mean? Besides the story mode, there are missions you can complete. These are pretty much what we were just discussing, where you have to fulfill a prerequisite to pass the mission. There are a total of 50, and each time you complete one, you'll be rewarded with Zenny. The Zenny can be used to unlock behind the scenes stuff from the movie, 
Yes, the movie, not the game, because that would be mildly interesting. And we can't have that! There's also a training, survival and arcade mode, which are all pretty much just copy pasted from Shin Budokai 1. One thing I'd like to point out though, that in arcade mode, Bulma is referred to as Bulma Enchanto. I have no idea why. In the movie, her last name is Briefs. Bulma Briefs. No clue on that one. If you were to isolate the gameplay, I mean just the fighting segments, Dragon Ball Evolution the game is actually pretty decent. But everything that surrounds the core gameplay is bloody awful. The graphics are ugly and the story sucks. There is no reason to play this game over Shin Budokai 2. You know what this game is? A really sad Shin Budokai 3. Oh, excuse me. When it was released in 2012, Dragon Ball Z Budokai HD Collection followed the trend of other remasters at the time by catering to the nostalgia of older players who wanted to play their favourite games on modern hardware. The collection is available on both the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. And just by looking at the cover, that this so-called collection is lacking at least one important component. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why not, you stupid bastard? First, let's address the elephant in the room. Where the hell is Budokai 2? This collection does not even include the main three titles. Yes, Budokai 2 has its issues like all games do, and personally I find it to be my least favourite out of the original trilogy, but that doesn't mean you can just leave it out. Many people adore Budokai 2, and it laid a solid foundation for Budokai 3's success. The movement and attack systems were much improved from Budokai 1, transformations were improved and actually made them usable, and fusions were also introduced. These are now standard in many Dragon Ball Z games, but Budokai 2 was one of the first to truly get these systems to work in a fun and intuitive manner. It also has a few features that aren't available in any of the other titles, like the water fusions, which are a lot of fun to experiment with and the unique Super Boo absorptions. These are mainly just gimmicks, but they're a lot of fun to play around with. Barbadie's Spaceship is an extra mode that you unlock after collecting all 7 Dragon Balls in the story mode, and it is one of the best extra modes in the entire Budokai series. The mode consists of 4 different fighting themed minigames. The minigames are very entertaining, and provide a welcome change of pace to the gameplay, without deviating too far from the core mechanics. Budokai 2 has a lot to offer, and I really do not understand why they excluded it from the collection. When asked why 2 was skipped, Namco Bankai Senior Global Brand Manager Jason Enos stated, But when we look at the three games, 1 and 3 are actually more straight up fighting games. 2 is a fighting game, but it also introduced some other elements of gameplay that kind of broke off from the fighting aspects a little bit. So when we finally decided which games to go with, obviously fans love different ones, but we decided we would bookend the compilation because the first game set up the Budokai series, defined what it was, and the third game was the final resolution of the Budokai series, ignoring the infinite world in the room. Honestly, this statement doesn't make any sense to me. It broke off a bit from fighting aspects, so what if it did? It is a Budokai game. It should have been in the Budokai collection. This statement was just from the brand manager, and in reality, he probably had no idea. Maybe it was because some people didn't like it? There wasn't enough demand? If it is that, then that is a pretty sorry excuse. I mean, the Devil May Cry HD collection included Devil May Cry 2, and that game is bloody awful. Where's the lamb sauce? Come on, man. The exclusion of Budokai 2 goes against the very concept of the collection, immediately making it feel incomplete. But what about the rest of the series? How about Shin Budokai? Is that included? No! What about Shin Budokai 2? No! Burst limit? Yes. I mean, I mean, no. No. Okay, surely they include Infinite World, the game that is all about showcasing the best of the Budokai series. Yeah, nah. <laughs> is it really a collection when two thirds of it is missing? HD collection? More like rip-off collection? Oh, okay, that's funny. So we laugh. I was like, mind your own business. Thanks to the power of the seventh generation, Budokai 1 and 3 look much sharper and more vibrant. However, because of the art style of Budokai 1, it doesn't benefit as much. The GameCube version, which has more cell shaded character designs, is not used in the HD collection. 
This could have been due to the fact that they did not have the source code for the GameCube version, as Pyramid was the developer for that version. But this is a speculation on my part. I, I don't actually know. Maybe they just didn't like it. Budokai 1 looks mostly the same, but wider. It does look kind of weird having the capsules where they are. I feel like they should have moved them more to the side. I don't know. It just looks weird. While the gameplay is in 16x9, the menus remain in 4x3, which is a good thing because these menus are still lovely and it would have been a shame if they had been stretched. The same is true for Budokai 3. The characters now have a specular effect that makes them stand out from the backgrounds. It's quite a striking effect that I really like. Unfortunately, some of the textures are a bit low res and blurry, especially those seen in the backgrounds. But you don't really notice it that much when you're actually playing because it movement so fast. There were a few other changes in addition to the graphical upgrade. The censorship for the PAL version is retained in Budokai 1 because violence is bad says the fighting game. When you enter versus mode, the second player character can now be switched to the custom setting, which was not available in the original release, which I didn't even notice, but yeah, that's a thing. Budokai 3 now includes all of the extra content from the Japanese release and the collector's edition, such as Goku with the halo, Trunks in the Saiyan armor, and King Piccolo costume for Piccolo, which are unlocked through the password system, which I did not know. I was like, I like went through the game so many times, I'm like, where are the, where are the costumes? But it's password. Would have been nice to have known that. There are also some new portraits in the story mode with more voice dialogue. Broly's ultimate attack has also been altered to be less brutal. There are no online features added, aside from some useless rankings. Honestly, I don't really care about this, but it probably should have been added. This is why we can't have nice things, Barry! Due to allegations of plagiarism against Kenji Yamamoto, the HD collection features a different soundtrack from that found in the original releases of the games. Let's check out some of these allegedly plagiarized tracks and take a listen. First up is one of my absolute favorite tracks from the series, Warrior from an Unknown Land. And now here is the song called Infinity by Stradivarius that was released two years prior. Another one of my favourites is the level up theme from Budokai 3. It is very similar to the song Everybody Dance by Sheik that came out all the way back in 1977. Then there is Thrilling Time that will perk up the ears of any Black Sabbath fans. Yeah, even as a kid I remember thinking this sounds a lot like Iron Man. This is just a taste of the music featured in the game and there are many more tracks that were inspired by other songs. Whether you agree or not that these are plagiarized doesn't matter as Genji's boss had decided there was enough evidence to fire him. Due to these copyright issues, the new soundtracks from Dragon Ball Z Budokai 1 and 3 combined music from Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi 2, 3, Raging Blast, Tenkaichi Tag Team, Ultimate Tenkaichi, plus entirely new music and the American Dragon Ball Z theme song from the original game and show. Both games also include the option to use the original Japanese language tracks, although in the European version only Japanese is available for Budokai 1, much like the original release. Plagiarized or not, I grew up with these songs, and the fact that they had to be taken out of the HD remaster, it just doesn't feel the same. It's not as good. You have been weighed. You have been measured. And you absolutely have been found wanting. Everything you remember about the modes and mechanics from Budokai 1 and 3 is still here. The only major changes were cosmetic, which is a good thing as these games are great, but all I can think about is where is the rest of it, you bastards. Well, that ended on a bit of a low note, but 
Thanks for anyone who watched the entire video. I really appreciate that and I hope you enjoyed this. Okay, bye.